It's now 7 p.m. and I would like to start the meeting of Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being live streamed to the Council's online webcast channel. I also would like to remind members and officers to turn off their, micro turn off their microphone when they are not speaking. I will get everyone an opportunity to speak at the end of each item. Can I ask all other mobile phones and electronic devices to be on silent during the meeting? Item one, apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair. No apologies received. Thank you. Item two, I move that the minutes of the Health and Wellbeing and Overview Scrutiny Committee held on the 17th of June 2021 to be approved and as correct record. Does any member have any comments on the minutes? Okay, Frank, we can have that marked as approved. Item three, urgent items of business. I've not agreed to any urgent items of business. Item four, decorations of interest. Does any members have any decorations of interest? As normal, I will state that as we are covering mental health today, I am sometimes doing uh, choose work for front mind. Item five. Items raised by Health Watch. Kim James, do you have any items raised? Thank you. <laughs> Item six was going to be responsive for portfolio holder for health. Unfortunately, due to personal situ uh, situations, this cannot happen. Uh, what we're doing as a part of the uh, scrutiny review process we are inviting all portfolio holders to come and to have a, a, a conversation with us in the chamber to go over their, what they are doing and what they're hoping to achieve and so we can have a better understanding of, of what job they're actually meant to be doing and we can keep control of. Um, in, in place of that, I'd like, I've asked Mark Tebbs, uh, if you'd like to just bring a a short overview of the briefing of the GP practices overview. Oh, that's on. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, hopefully members will ever receive the briefing note on the kind of GP practice overview. So the note is intended to just provide um, some current context to the um, pressures uh, being experienced in general practice at the moment. So the paper provides a run through of uh, the current situation uh, and some of the context um, that general practice has faced over the last 18 months or so. So the paper um, uh, hopefully summarises probably what most people are feeling on the ground, uh, which is um, the kind of uh, challenges and frustrations that the public are facing in terms of getting access to primary care. Uh, the paper provides a summary of some of the uh, actions that we are supporting primary care to uh, undertake to manage some of those pressures um, and um, it lists um, some of the actions that we are undertaking to uh, increase some of the capacity in primary care through the recruitment of uh, additional roles, uh, some of the project support we are providing uh, to primary care to help them um, uh, work together in the newly formed primary care networks, uh, the work that we are doing with the clinical directors around extending the COF and improving the and restarting the management of long-term conditions, uh, the support that we're doing or the work we're doing with public health colleagues uh, around um, uh, uh, the practice cards and supporting them with kind of informatic support. Um, uh, yesterday, we, um, or Health Watch, uh, hosted a Facebook live session um, as part of the communication plan with um, the residents to, of Thurrock to help understand the kind of current pressures that are happening in, uh, in general practice and, uh, and indeed um, how we can work together to improve the current situation. 
Um, and um, we are also uh, working with some of the more challenged practices to um, uh, help them with their kind of CQC ratings and the kind of associated quality improvement action plans. So the, the briefing note is just uh, intended to uh, kind of follow on from some of the discussions that happened at the last HOSC meeting, uh, provide a summary of the kind of current situation that's happening in primary care and some of the actions that we are doing to support uh, the current situation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, just put something to a bit of context as well for people that are reviewing this online. On the uh, 21st of July, uh, a patient survey showed that Farrell has the lowest overall experience rate in the Mid and South Essex. Uh, I mean, that, that's quite, quite disappointing. I think as a, as a local councillor, the most complaint I get is not answering the phones. Um, patients walking in there while their phones are still ringing and not being able to get access that way. Um, the other one is the um, I don't know if it's triage or the pharmacy, they get forwarded via one phone call to another phone call and they end up being told by a pharmacist that you know, they're having some sort of treatment change. And they go, well, you're, you're not the doctor, I've not even spoken to a doctor yet. And they get sort of quite worried in, in that sort of thing. Um, as for, for direct questions for you, it's not really going to be able to be answered on this. It's like, when, when is it going to change? When are we really going to see that improvement? So I don't think there's a there's, there's not a magic bullet. Um, there's not a there's not a quick solution to um, the current situation that primary care faces, and indeed the NHS generally faces. Um, I think what the paper sets out is some of the kind of long term impacts that COVID has on operational delivery. So uh, the impact of um, delivering the vaccination program, uh, the fact that there are um, extensive waiting lists in secondary care, which means that the burden on primary care is therefore that much greater. Um, to provide COVID safe services um, and uh, a kind of a, a more uh, a mixed hybrid model means that there's additional burdens on the telephone lines. So it's more difficult to get through uh, on the phone. There's less access to and less desirability around using interims, kind of working across different uh, practices. So there's multiple um, factors that are contributing to um, uh, the, the difficulties that we heard, for example, at the Facebook event yesterday. Um, we are uh, working through um, our action plan. Um, there are plans in place to recruit additional roles um, but as you'll know it is difficult to attract new GPs into the area. Um, there are plans to improve the estate so that there's a better environment for, um, for, for both practitioners and the public but again this is not a quick solution. Um, uh, we have um, been asked to do a um, kind of like a, a comprehensive response to the primary care strategy for the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, uh, uh, for the September Health and Wellbeing Board. So th this is kind of a, a kind of like a briefing note, but we are also working on a kind of a, a response um, uh, to the Health and Wellbeing Board in terms of the kind of the, the strategy and the work that we're doing uh, with public health colleagues around kind of uh, demand and supply uh, modelling. Um, so we are working on a number of fronts and I think that that further paper will provide a more comprehensive um, response and we're happy to provide a, a briefing note in, in, uh, in subsequent months uh, if the chair would like that. Um, but there isn't, you know, there isn't a magic bullet to, 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 to this, I don't think. Um, I think it will take um, a little while for, um, uh, for the situation to, uh, to, to improve. Um, although we are uh, working really hard to, uh, for that to happen as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we, um, 
what I don't want people to take away from this is that this is a, a blanket negative for our GP services. We've got some brilliant doctors in Farrock. You know, this is, there's some certain surgeries that need to be improved. Are we identifying those surgeries and targeting them specific for help? Yeah. Um, so, s some years ago, um, colleagues will remember that we had um, the majority of our um, practices were, uh, were weren't rated good, uh, and, and now the vast majority of them are rated good. Indeed, we've only got now one practice that is rated inadequate so there has been a uh, a big improvement in the cqc rating of practices within within thorough which is obviously great news and that's been um uh, largely sort of the hard work of the practices themselves but also the kind of support that we've kind of put into primary care to support them uh, through, through through that process and and obviously we continue to do that through kind of quality visits, the, the work we're doing with kind of scorecards, um, the investment in uh, kind of project management support so we can help the primary care network development and how uh, practices can work together in localities. So, um, so absolutely we are, um, you know, working really closely and really hard with our more challenged practices because, um, you know, certainly the kind of feedback from the event yesterday was and through through other forums is that sense that not all primary care in thorough is equal that there's a kind of variability in quality and we obviously need to raise the kind of bar across the across the board thank you uh, council hardaway thank you chair and thank you mark for uh, producing the the note for us um a few questions obviously uh i mean isn't this fundamentally a, a workforce issue not just amongst gps but across all of the the teams that kind of offer primary care um and is it a case that there isn't enough gps is it a national issue or is it that they we have a recruitment prob problem here in in thorough is it is it something that everywhere is across the country is facing um i ask this because is it something that we need to escalate to our members of parliament to ask government to to kind of do something at a national level to increase the number of of, of gps um so that's my, my first question. Um, the second question is about um, in our the actions being taken. Number one, it talks about kind of the additional roles being recruited to, and it's great to see. Obviously, there should be uh, across across skills mix of, of prescribers and people and clinicians to see uh, people. But what does this? How does this type of recruitment help GP practices and, and patients who are kind of uh, coming in um, and, and managing? And I think the third one is how do we um, how is it how is the picture of a good of our gp surgery pulled together you mentioned scorecards but how how do we know that kind of how they're performing do we speak do we speak to patients is it based on complaints how do we get the proper picture without speaking to residents because i know we all hear you know we can't get a gp appointment and we got feed it into you how is it how is that picture kind of pulled together so that we do know really what's going on at, at that level thank you thanks chair so yes, yeah, so there are um, a nas national shortage of uh, of GPs, um, but within Thurrock we have especially low levels of uh, GP per kind of head of population. So um, so our, our levels are um, lower than 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 elsewhere. Um, we have increased the number of. Um, frontline clinicians over the last couple of years has been a significant um, increase in the number of uh, frontline clinicians um, and that's been part of the kind of work on the kind of new models of care so kind of developing a, uh, a kind of like a, a mixed skill workforce and um, uh, and and I think that's taking a little bit of time to kind of to kind of communicate to the public so um, I think there's often some resistance um, from people feeling that um, they're being asked by receptionists around kind of what their conditions are, but that's obviously the direct people to um, the right professional within primary care to help them, whether that be the physio or the pharmacist or the, the practice nurse or, 
or the GP. So, so there is um, there is an expansion in in the workforce and more plans to expand further. Uh, and I think we've got more work to do around kind of communicating that kind of mixed skill um, kind of workforce and the the kind of the different model in primary care. Um, what was your, what was your last question? Your last bit of your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so obviously CQC is part of that, the kind of ratings, but that that doesn't happen uh, very often. Um, um, there is um, there are kind of the the kind of scorecards that we're developing with, uh, with with primary care, which kind of summarizes um, a, a number of kind of indicators. Um, there's the QOF work. Um, the practices are. Uh, encouraged uh, to have uh, kind of patient participation groups to kind of hear from from their patient patient groups. Um, so there are a number of different ways for us to kind of monitor the kind of like the effectiveness um, of of primary care. Um, so it's it's not it's not a one size fits all. There's a kind of number of different routes to to do that. Thank you, Mark. Councillor Fish. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of things. Uh, you talked about some of the uh, surgeries in Thurrock facing challenges. Can you give us an idea of specifically what those kind of challenges are, in which areas they're performing poorly? That's the first question. So, um, so, um, so across across the board, um, generally uh, the the vast majority of practices in Thurrock are are rated good. Uh, we have one that is uh, that is inadequate. Um, the kind of CQC um, uh, kind of rating system scores practices on kind of safe care, uh, effective care, uh, a leadership. So it looks at a kind of a number of different kind of criteria uh, for a kind of like a, a good performing. Uh, practice and there, there's a there's a rating on each of those different elements. Uh, offhand, I can't recall what the particular challenges are of the in inadequate practice that we've got at the moment. What what area that lets them down on that overall rating? Um, but that's the kind of that's the mechanism of of scoring the practices. So it'd be one area uh, out those various areas, or more than one area. So the practices get a kind of like an overall rating of um, of good or inadequate, inadequate or, or requires improvement, um, but that score is kind of made up of kind of four different um, kind of areas of uh, of practice. So leadership, safety, um, and kind of quality of care. Okay, thank you. And then second question um, talked about various roles being new roles being. Um, undertaken by GP surgeries. So in something like um, social prescribing, um, what would be the challenge to the GP surgery in uh, trying to recruit people for that kind of a role? Um, so the, the, the social prescribing um, offer is, is actually run by, well, Kim's got her hand up, so I'll, I'll let Kim answer that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll answer the social prescribing one first. Um, Thurrock CVS actually uh, recruits social prescribers, um, so it is a community resource as well. But since the takeover or come on board with PCNs, they are now embedded within PCN areas, yeah. but they are still recruited and HR managed by us, um, but they are placed within the PCN areas. So they still have a massive into the voluntary sector organisations because obviously social prescribing is not a clinical model, it's more a social model, so they support people to access services that are within communities um, rather than within a clinical setting. Okay. But we recruit them and they sit, un actually they sit under my management as, as um, health and social care lead. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
I yep. misunderstood then. I, I thought that had been taken over by the PCNs and yep. they're still ours, CBS. but they're placed. They, they're recruited and managed by us, but they sit within a PCN area now, okay. rather than once offer across the whole borough. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I come in on some of yeah. the previous bit? Thank you. Yeah. Um, obviously, Mark touched on um, the Facebook Live event last night. Um, we had a panel with GPs, two GPs and two practice managers, and I think we had from the public in the region of 130 questions put to them. Many of them were the same thing about access. Um, I think Mark touched on that there was a there's a big difference, and that was quite obvious, from one end of the borough to another, from surgery to surgery, and we've seen that with lots of things over the years. Um, that was one of the reasons why we tried to hold that event to try and ex for, for them for the GPs to have the opportunity to explain how the system is working. Um, we have challenged back to the CCG, and it was taken on board last night, that there needs to be more communication. People don't understand. They don't understand how this new system is working. There are many that believe that doctors are not even there, that they're at home working. They don't even know that they're there. They don't, really, they don't understand the triage. They were very clear that they don't want to talk to receptionists about their conditions or their issues. They don't think that's right. So there was a lot of explanation about how that is then triaged as what is important and who needs to be seen first for a call back. There was discussions around how the hour, you know, there, there is appointments available face to face and if they're needed, they will be brought in. So we touched a tiny little amount of people last night, tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, we're going to carry on. We won't do this. Was like a trial of that because there's many, many people putting on Facebook their concerns, and we thought if we aimed it at that first. But we will be going out into communities. We are doing some work around all of the surgeries. What is your process? Are you doing face to face? How many appointments? What sort of phone system have you got? How many lines have you got coming in? So that we, as an independent, can look at everything. So when people phone us we will have some information on how your surgery works because we don't know. We know that how this one works and we might know how that one works. So we can do a whole piece of work so we understand. Also, if they're telling us this is how they're working and then we're still being seen that that's not actually how they're working, it gives us the opportunity to challenge that because at the moment we can't challenge what we don't know. We can only be told what's happening. Um, we also... Um, any issues that we get raised with us, of which we do get lots and lots and lots, we keep reports of those. We share that with the CCG, with the primary care team, so they do know what the word on the street is. We also work closely with the CQC, so when they're coming into the borough and they're going to look at a practice, they will contact us beforehand and we give them all the intel, all the information, all the voices that we have. So those patients' voices do get fed in to that system. So we do quite a lot out there. Um, we spoke last night about encouraging people to join their PPGs, be part of the solution, be that voice of patients, you know, go in and say this isn't working and this is why not. So we are really doing an awful lot of work independently to keep an eye on what is going on, but we will be back out into communities where we're now going back out and we're going to be doing more events and more opportunities for people to talk to us. We're going to go back to our Change One Thing campaign, which is a really good way of doing it. It's one question. If you could change one thing about the, your service here, or your, what, you know, the service you receive here, what would it be? Then we can collate all that and see what the main issues are, rather than ask 100 questions. So we will bring that report back when, as well to feed in. Thank you, Kim. I will say that last night, Facebook was all trying to track down your link to try and find where it was, so everyone was trying to join it. Um, I think it was this thing that obviously a lot of people want to have their input into it. Um, there is a growing concern in the communities. And I know at where I live in, in Stanford and Corinum, we've got concern with bone surgeries, and a lot of people on the local Facebook pages were trying to find the link last night. I'm glad everyone didn't because it probably would have been unmanageable for you. But yeah, definitely those type of events, engaging in the community on social media like that is definitely going to give you more feedback. Do you find it that the residents are slower or have been slower to come forward with complaints about doctor surgeries? Does it take a lot for something to go wrong before they finally come to you? 
No. <laughs> um, it varies. Sometimes we get calls that are really not nice to listen to, where people have struggled and managed and not done something, and it's got to such a point. But then we get people who, you know, they they just constantly are trying to get through and they can't get through, and they'll put the phone down and they'll phone us because they think that somehow we can get them through to the GP. So we'll pick those sorts of calls up. Um, a lot of people just do not understand. It went really quiet during COVID. People seemed to just stop. We were still working all through COVID, but we didn't get any calls, is what I'm saying. We, we in Health Watch, we were still working, but our calls to us for complaints and issues dropped, even though we were still pushing out on social media that we're still out there. We were still giving as much information as we could. But our calls to us from patients stopped for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but they've certainly picked back up again once they've realised that services are are open again and, and obviously they can't get back in there. So um, it, it, it can fluctuate. Uh, Councillor Polly. That's it. Um, a couple of questions to Mark, if I may. Um, we mentioned in the briefing note that um, estates is a problem. I, I wondered if he could um, enlighten me to to some of the issues that we're referring to. What are the problems with estates that stop a GP that pre-COVID could see patients, but during COVID now can't see patients, but I'm presuming they're still in the same surgery or still with the same estates. We also have a note that... Um, that uh, al allegedly the number of appointments provided has increased. Um, I don't know what... Th th there's no breakdown to that statement. There's nothing given to, to say ha it, what the percentage are, whether that's more telephone appointments, whether there was more face-to-face -face appointments. I, I don't dispute that, that GPs are phoning patients more, but whether they are actual um, effective uh, GP appointments or... or uh, so I, I, I don't know how we arrive at the uh, increased appointments and I don't know how what figures... I know, I know um, the ambulance service has seen a 37% increase in calls and uh, we've got GP receptionists just advising to, if a patient is worried, to phone 999 or 111. I, do, I, I don't know if 111 comes under CCG's remit. It probably doesn't. But I do, I do think there's some work there to do with this risk uh, avoidance culture that we seem to be in. Um, everybody, everybody seems to say that they're at capacity... They, they can't see the patient, they can't deal with the patient, um, that, that the patient doesn't need a face-to-face -face without having a face-to-face -face with the patient, which is... Um, I, I, I wonder how effective that triage is. We've heard many, many residents throughout the, the, the whole of Thurrock, and I don't think it's just a, an area-based thing, make comments about not being able to get through the, the magic phone back at 8 o'clock in the morning, spend 45 minutes, three hours, 45 minutes, and still not getting through. I mean, we, we have £10 mobile phones, for goodness sakes, with Simsy. If, what, if we don't need a, an expensive, glorified telephony system. If, if we've got the nurse practitioners, if we've got the other... Um, prescribers in the surgeries, then by all means, let the call go through the main switchboard, receptionist take a number, and then let the, and then let the clinicians call back on the mobile phones. Maybe I'm being too simplistic. I'm sure there'll be a reason why we can't do something quite effective, quite easily, and quite inexpensively, to be truthful. So, on on the numbers, um, so on the kind of capacity 
uh, modelling that we've been undertaking, we are, or primary care is delivering more appointments than it was this time last year. Um, but you're absolutely right, the kind of the proportion of those uh, and how those are delivered has changed. So much more telephone, much more online. So the kind of proportion of um, of face-to-face -face, um, appointments has gone down, proportion of telephone appointments has gone up, but the overall level of activity um, has actually gone up. And I guess it's just, um, you know, countering some of those kind of perceptions that we heard yesterday that kind of GP practices are closed and that the kind of that that GPs are not working because that's that's absolutely not the case but clearly the model of care has, has changed um, I think the um, part of the solution is um, you know how uh, but we absolutely recognize that that the telephone access is a real problem and people are, you know, spending sometimes an hour trying to get through to get an appointment. Um, uh, I think what was really useful last night was just, and we need to do more of it, was just a communication around the different ways to kind of get information. So the kind of 111 uh, website is a really good source of information around um, kind of, uh, of complaints. Um, GPs are really encouraging people to use the e-consult kind of process because that really um, helps them to uh, manage the conditions in the most kind of time effective way so they can have more appointments and kind of get back to people quicker. Using the NHS app for repeat prescriptions um, uh, rather than kind of calling up the, um, rather than calling up the surgery and kind of blocking that line for, for people who need it for other other reasons so so I think it's and I, and I think that's why the events yesterday and the kind of Facebook events we need to kind of do some more of that because um, I think um, uh, it, it's not you know there isn't you know I don't I don't think there's one solution to this I think it's kind of it's working across kind of uh, multiple solutions or multiple actions um, I think the reference in the paper to the estates was just where we've kind of got older states uh, that wasn't that are not kind of purpose uh, built. Um, trying to kind of create kind of COVID safe environments where there's kind of distances between chairs is more challenging in some buildings than it than it is in others. So it was just a reference to like having kind of one way flow systems and kind of uh, social distancing within kind of waiting rooms is just more more challenging in some some states than others. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think it came across last night as one of your social media things that what people were worried about was that they ended up with more complex issues by not seeing a doctor. So things that could have been solved very, really quickly have now got more complicated and ended up with more hospital attendances because of that. Um, and I think, you know, we know, you know Basel Hospital were referring to Broomfield last night and so the you know, hospitals are filling up. And it does seem that the first port of call for a lot of doctors now is go to A&E. And it's that thing, I don't think we cannot, you can't be face-to-face -face contact with a doctor for your first point of call to, to help solve a problem. And I think that's what our residents want. I think they're not happy with the phone service, being diagnosed over a phone. I don't think wash it with a lot of residents. Um, I, th I think it's a lack of confidence they have in that. Um, I don't think they take on board maybe how much can be gained for, via the tele telephone conversation and I guess if it was like high definition video calls that they were doing it may be slightly different um, but yeah but if, uh, yeah, if you could bring that fee um, a review back over a briefing from when it goes to Wellbeing Board that'd be great thank you So item seven, 2020-21 annual complaints represent, uh, yeah, sorry, report for adult social care services. Uh, can I ask Lee Henry to present the item, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, I'll, I'll provide a, a high level summary of the report and then happy to take any questions. So, so this is our annual um, adult social care complaints report. 
Um, the, the detail for this report is contained really in the appendix, which is on page 21. Um, so what I'll do, I'll summarise that, that appendix for you uh, and then take a take any questions. So, so on page 21, it, it captures activity levels for, for the reporting period. Um, so, so you will see from this that, that there has been an increase in complaints, 19 last year, um, compared with 28 for this year. But it's just worth noting that, that my team, the complaints team, we, we now write to all, all providers on a quarterly basis um, to establish if they've got any, had any complaints that they, they may not have made their council aware of. So that could well be a reason for the increase in complaints. Um, page 21 also highlights a, a significant increase in, in council inquiries uh, for reporting periods. Um, so we had lots of inquiries in relation to, to COVID for, for our members, um, but we had no complaints actually in relation to, to COVID. On page 22, um, this highlights that the 81% of those complaints that were received um, were responded within time frame. That was 22 complaints out of 27. Um, that's a slight improvement um, compared to the previous year, where, whereby 79% of complaints were responded to within time frame. Page 22 also highlights that 57% of complaints were upheld. Again, a slight improvement compared to last year, where 61% of complaints were upheld. Pages 23 to 26, um, what we've tried to do is, is, is to capture some, some learning based on, based on those 16 upheld complaints. And the key themes there um, for those upheld complaints are around quality of care and, and communication. Page 27 and 28, that summarises um, the areas that the complaints relate to, whether they're internal services or, or, or commission providers. And on page 29, it provides a, a, a breakdown of those upheld complaints. Percentage upheld complaints are higher there for a number of providers because the complaint volumes are low. And pages um, pages 30 well, would have provided a summary of local government ombudsman complaints. Um, however, for the reporting period, we had no local government ombudsman findings, so that's a positive for the council. Page 31 to 32 really just provides a summary of, of the areas that, that our council inquiries and, and our MP inquiries relate to. And pages 33 onwards um, provides information on conflicts. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lee. Uh, overall, I find it a very, very positive report. I think, though, considering what we've been through during that time period, it could have been could have been disastrous. But I think this shows how well the, we did cope as a borough with our social care, or adult care. Um, I think one thing that just struck out with me was that we had no ombudsman complaints. And I think that is an extreme positive to take, take away from this. Uh, when you view it yourself, what do you think is the biggest learning curve that you've had from this report? Thanks, yeah. I, I mean, I echo your words. I, I think, I mean, first and foremost, it, it really is a positive report. Um, Yes, there has been a slight increase in complaints, but to some extent, you know, we are now going out of our way to track down those complaints by writing to commission providers every quarter. So, so there's no surprise there, in my view. As you say, you know, the fact that we've got no ombudsman, um, no negative findings from the ombudsman, is is a fantastic achievement. I mean, that really shows that you know we, we're actually um, responding to complaints and dealing with those issues, you know, as part of our internal process. And they're not having to escalate to the ombudsman, so that's again, you know, a really good achievement. You know, slight increase in performance, slight increase in the percentage upheld, and, and a slight increase in confidence. So I think overall, really positive report. Um, I think, I think the thing I'm taking away from it is, in if there's any negatives, is um, you know, it's really still still trying to you know kind of learn, learn from some of those 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 complaint areas to make sure. You know that there's no kind of um, repeated complaints around some of those communication issues or, or quality of care issues, and I know that our, our, our you know our, our, co our contracts team within our social care, you know they're actively going out as part of their compliance work to making sure that you know what we've said we'll be doing differently is actually being done differently. So that's a real positive for me. Yeah, that's brilliant, uh, Councillor Fish. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I think it's generally speaking a very positive report. Um, just um, interested in some of the details around it because um, in one particular 
complaint it talks about uh, hot liquid being spilt on a service user, then it says extra training was given, additional training was given to the person that, that had um, done that. I find that a bit puzzling because I would have thought that they would have had the training before they actually worked with the service user adequately so that they wouldn't be spilling hot liquid. And then the follow on from that is, does that mean then that that training is then put into the, because it appears that that training wasn't part of the um, kind of induction training or initial training, does that then become part of the induction training for everybody in that situation? Yeah, thank you, Councillor yeah, Fish. Um, yeah, in, ter in terms of, um, let me just pick up that, that particular complaint reference, because that is that, that's complaint, um, complaint reference 13, isn't it? Okay. Um, I mean, I've, again, so that, that's a, a commission, that's one of our commission providers' um, response in terms of the learning activity there. Um, I think when, I think that there's some additional detail that may not have been clear in the report, so, so I've got some separate information, so bear me one second. Um, so I think with that particular complaint, um, in relation to the hot drink being spilled over the client, it, it would say it, it was that was one element. And another element was the lack of communication with family members. Um, but for that particular complaint, I think the deputy manager there um, spoke to to, to to the service user's family, um, and it then who then discussed the complaint, and it then transpired that actually the real the real element of the complaint was around the lack of communication and not the spilling of the drink. So I haven't got much more than that, but I hope that helps provide some supplementary information. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, I also noticed that our compliments have increased as well. There's, uh, and I, I personally were with two organisations that work with the hom homeless on Saturday morning at Morrison's, um, the Food Bank and the Friends of Essex and um, London Homeless, and they they were both extremely complimentary about the, the local area coordination um, teams um, who have been, in their words, amazing, um, with their work with the uh, everyone in projects um, and there was a statement that Havrian are trying to replicate Thurrock's example but they just don't get it the way Thurrock gets it so I think that's uh, an amazing uh, accolade to the teams and Thurrock first uh, absolutely I've had family members who, who uh, as we've just had the discussion about it, if, you know, in a time of health anxiety for everybody and feel that the GPs are not available, they're at first have come into their own. They've been the people that have provided the solution to the problem, not the problem. So um, I'm glad to see that they're uh, mentioned in the report. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I would agree, I think it is positive that the number of complaints isn't extremely high. And um, as that was pointed out, it's because we're trying to fish out more of those um, issues. I think that, you know, look, look, we obviously don't get a lot of detail, um, obviously, that, that's been said, but it is quite worrying, especially around the quality of care com complaints and that the issue, as Councillor Fish raises, is, is training, is, is just training. And I'm assuming that those are kind of less serious, but to read them, they are quite upsetting, like the conduct of staff and the conduct of staff relating to antibiotics the like people not following care plans these are really 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 important things and just a bit up it's just a bit upsetting to read and again i'm not sure kind of the level of seriousness obviously has gone to complaint level but um yeah i, I think it was just is is training you know have any of them gone further than you know basically not telling someone to you know telling people to i guess properly do their jobs retraining does any have any of them gone any further to kind of dismissal level and how many chances do we give people to retrain for some of these things? Um, yeah, thanks, Councillor Oliver. I, I probably, I don't think I can answer that question based on, on, on my role and, and the complaints team, but I know, I know that there may be others on, on the call that might be able to 
help with that. All I do know is that, let's say, our, our contracts team do, 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 do as part of their compliance work. They're actively looking to make sure that we are learning from these complaints. So, so I can't provide any information. Apologies to that. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Who's, who's going to answer who's the question from, from, the, from, from the rest of the uh, people attending this evening? Who wants it? Ian, I'll nominate you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Oh, there we are. Um, uh, I'll maybe start, and maybe Catherine could come in in terms of some of the commissioning, because a lot of this is our commissioned um, services. Um, i just say a few things. I think we just need to put this in some context. So we've got 16 complaints upheld over a year uh, against the um, thousands of care interactions that happen every day with hundreds and hundreds of service users. Um, and we have uh, over four times as many compliments as complaints. Um, I've spent quite a lot of time since I've been in my new role going out and talking to the, the front line. And we just have, I think, some amazing um, frontline staff who have put their lives at risk over the last 14 months. Many have been infected with um, COVID. You know, when everyone else was self-isolating at home to, to try and do their best. Um, and they're not robots, and not, however good your training is, in challenging circumstances, things do go wrong. Things go wrong in, in the NHS every day. Um, so we have a strong compliance um, regime and a compliance team on top of the CPC inspections. Um, we have a really, really good relationship with all of our providers, and that's something that comes up repeatedly at our provider forums about how much they welcome um, the relationship compared to how they experience that relationship in, in other local authorities. Um, so while 16 is still 16 too many, and we would always um, aim for zero, um, I, I, I'm as confident as I can be that we're doing everything that we can systemically to, to try and keep uh, mistakes to an absolute minimum. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant. Um, yeah, no, that is very reassuring. And of course, you know, you know, as you said, staff are acting, you know, phenomenally. But I know that you know we do have to be, you know, worried about those sixteen. Even though it is sixteen, yeah, we are we are in a really really good place. But one of those people might, you know, could be one of our family members. So yeah, really really commend the work of the of the team. Um, and I feel very reassured. So thank you, Ian. Any more questions for anyone? Nope. Okay, uh, Lee, you can leave if you like. <laughs> After that one. After that one. Thank you, Rob. Okay, moving on to item eight. This is the Forex Safeguarding Adults Board Annual Report. Can I ask Jim Nicholson to present this, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Nicholson. I'm the independent chair of the Safeguarding Adult Board in Thurrock. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be along tonight to present um, this report, which I think, in summary, uh, has a number of challenges in it. Uh, but also, I think, as with the last item, there, there are some encouraging uh, uh, elements to it. The, the two papers before you tonight, the first is the actual report itself and then a covering report. There's a lot of detail in this and I think with the Chair's permission what I'll do is speak to a couple of uh, key points I think and then uh, members can uh, focus on areas of particular interest. Um, the, the first point is made uh, right at the beginning which is that there's a statutory responsibility uh, on uh, safeguard and up boards to produce an annual report. There are three such responsibilities. The other two are to produce a strategic plan. This was refreshed last year, running through to 22-23. And uh, just as a quick aside, um, you'll be hearing later about the tobacco control work that uh, Bex Willen's been doing. She spoke to our board, and, and as a consequence, the strategy refresh has included additional work in, in that area. But the third area... Uh, let me also say that we've produced easy read versions of both the plan, annual plan that is, and the st strategic plan with the help of um, uh, 
Neil Woodbridge and Thoric Lifestyle Solutions. And, and I would commend these easy reads because uh, it certainly helps me understand what, what the strategies are all about. And, and obviously they're a great benefit to um, uh, members of our community that aren't as uh, comfortable with, with, with the full documents. But the third area that we have to uh, have a responsibility for is to conduct um, uh, safeguarding adult reviews. These are, as, as members will know, uh, reviews that have to take place if so somebody who has uh, uh, care or support needs dies or suffers serious injury through neglect or abuse. Um, these came into being in 2015 when the CARE Act was enacted and uh, for the period up to including that covered by this annual report, there hasn't been one in Thurrock. We are one of a vanishingly small number of authorities which hasn't had a, a SAR. The same is true with domestic homicide reviews, as members will be aware. Uh, that's changed. And uh, in the past couple of weeks, we have commissioned two such safeguarding adult reviews, uh, one of which is actually a combined, uh, is combined with the domestic homicide review. So the details of this are uh, probably not appropriate to go into tonight, but no doubt in due course, members will want to be uh, briefed on, on the circumstances and progress. These take a while to go through. Uh, but we have, uh, we have launched those. Um, in terms of wider issues, we've spoken a lot tonight about COVID and, and you will see that runs through this and it's impacted on the performance figures compared to previous years. But also uh, right back at the beginning of this, members will be aware of the um, great concern about um, residents in care homes and uh, how that issue is being addressed. And uh, we've had comparatively mercifully few such deaths. But at the last executive meeting, we reviewed um, the, uh, the, the, the fatalities in, in, in care homes. And it's, it's fair to say that very few care homes have had fatalities in more than one quarter, which means that there's been a spike or, a, or an outbreak and, and it's then been contained. Uh, so the view of the executive was that there was nothing further that needed a, a examination at this stage. Um, moving on to uh, page 50 of, of, of the agenda, that's the financial picture. And, and bluntly, uh, we are in uh, a, <laughs> a very healthy situation financially, which reflects the fact that such so little activity took place in, in the, the year under consideration. That will change. Um, and uh, we, we have gone a, a very co comprehensive program of activities that, that will be funded by, by those... Um, the figures that you've seen. Uh, in terms of performance, on, on to page 52, uh, you can see that um, concerns rose slightly from exactly 1,000 in 2019-2020 to 1,071. Uh, but um, inquiries uh, that came from that actually fell. Now, this is not something that we would see as good news, and we certainly wouldn't welcome it. It does actually reflect a national trend and that's just the inability of uh, staff to actually undertake uh, the inquiries that are necessary. Um, it's, it's right to say that th those figures are starting to pick up now as, uh, as we return to what we recognise uh, as a m more normal situation. But it's also right to say that the numbers of concerns have increased greatly in quarter one of the current year compared to quarter one of the previous year. Uh, and again, uh, that's something that we actually welcome because it, it confirms people's awareness of, of, of the processes and the routes to and the reporting uh, pathways. If we move on to page 55, I'm particularly uh, proud of this, I suppose. Um, members will be very familiar with the concept of making safeguarding personal. And here we see that um, when um, a concern is raised, um, the individual or the representative is, is asked to state what the outcome is, is desired. And you'll see that this is met fully or partially in 95% of cases. I, I, I think that is uh, very commendable for, for staff in adult social care. Um, page 63, now we look at um, progress against the four strategic objectives in, in the strategy, both what was achieved in the year under review and what's planned for the current year. Um, there's a full update going to uh, be undertaken at the next meeting of uh, the Safeguarding Adult Board on the 30th of September, and uh, the details will be available after that. But I would just uh, like to draw your attention to one of the actions under Strategic Objective 2, 
that's implementing the sexual abuse GSNA. And that is the um, completion of a study into um, the extent of adult sexual exploitation in Thurrock. Um, we're, we're a leader here. Uh, this has attracted national interest. It's just actually been published and it demonstrates a number, a number of things. N now isn't the t I haven't the time to go into that in any great detail, but, but uh, it's something that I, I'm sure members will want to be aware of, and, and uh, we are very enthusiastically engaged in implementing the, the findings that, that came from that. Um, moving on to page 66, um, we haven't been as good at communicating as, as we should have been over the years, and uh, uh, we are doing a lot to try and uh, make up for, uh, for that. And we have a communications plan. Uh, you will see uh, some of the activity on the website. That, that has just uh, increased further in the current year. And also we have a wide program of engagement with the various national campaigns that we see uh, week, week on week. And the most important one for us uh, takes place on the third week of November. That's the uh, National Safeguarding Awareness Week. And we have a full program uh, in conjunction with colleagues in Essex and South End, um, to uh, address a number of topics. Uh, each day there's a different topic. Last year this was about financial abuse. This year it's looking at things like modern slavery, uh, cuckooing, uh, hate crime, the Prevent program, and uh, domestic abuse. So um, apologies if that was a, a rush through, but um, there is a lot in here, and, and I think maybe time would be better spent addressing members. Uh, own uh, areas of interest. Thank you. Thank you for that. It, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a deep report. Um, I found it extremely interesting. I think throughout the whole report, in the back of my mind, did sit this thing that there, there's hidden problems out there because of COVID. And it just kept coming to the forefront of my mind that, you know, these figures have dropped because people are not seeing these people that are in danger. And it was just one of those things that, you know, I'm glad we're opening, we're opening back up now. We are making these visits, um, and these people will get some help. Um, but it's great to see the impact the uh, local area coordinators are doing with linking up with services. I think it's been a real positive. Um, social media, definitely, I think, where you're, you've been pushing out on that with more activity, I think that's really great, and more awareness is being made. I think there's some great gains coming through on this. Um, it does link over with the uh, new prevent strategy that we're, we're doing. Um, so it's, it's going to have a double impact. It's going to be challenged from both ends. So we're hoping that we can... I know you said we're seen as a bit of a leader on the sensual, uh, sexual... I had to put the word on it. The adult sexual exploitation. So, uh, sexual exploitation. I think that's um, something that I'd love to hear more about on how we've put in practice to solve that because I know in many other areas it's a really big concern and if they're seeing us as a leader that's really good news. Uh, do any other members have any any questions? Councillor Holloway, thank you. Thank you Chair, yeah just to again say um, echo the Chair's words, it was, it's an excellent report, a detailed report um, and it's great as well to see um, the sexual abuse violence JSNA kind of being considered and to see that 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 there is cross-working across all the elements of important pieces of work coming together and seeing those referenced, cross-referenced. So that, that, yeah, that is just a, a, a excellent, just really great work, and thank you. Thank you. What, what, one of my key jobs is to make sure we don't duplicate what other people are doing, of course, because if you look at the agenda that I mentioned for the uh, National Safeguarding Awareness Week, you could very easily see that as coming under community safety. Uh, so my job is to, is to keep the margins as... I mean, there is overlap and, uh, and support, which, which is what makes it fly, bluntly. Uh, but equally, we have to make sure we focus on what we do and leave others to focus on what they do. So thank you very much for your thoughts. I think, I, I think that your report actually answered quite a lot of the questions that was going through it. It's, uh, it's very well written. Uh, thank you. And I believe that you're, you're free to leave it if you wish. <laughs> Yes, Chair, I've left my wife at Lakeside, so I'm quite keen to get going. <laughs> She's spent all your money now. <laughs> okay, item, item nine, personality disorders and complex needs presentation. Can I ask Mark Tibbs to present this item, please? 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to give a, a few words and then I'm going to hand over to um, Jane and the team to present the report. Um, but I did want to kind of bring us back to uh, a previous host committee where uh, Kim from Health Watch kind of uh, brought up the kind of issue of complex uh, people with complex mental health problems and uh, a sense that um, that agencies were kind of running away from people with some of the most vulnerable people in, in, in our society and it was often left to organisations like Health Watch to kind of pick up the pieces and that we needed a, a real significant kind of cultural change around how we managed uh, some of the most kind of vulnerable um, people in our in our society and I think and that was some years ago uh, and I think what we'll hear from the presentation from the team today is that actually we've kind of gone for a real cultural shift and a kind of revolution in the way that that care is delivered so um, so I will now hand over to Jane to kind of talk through uh, the detail of the work that, um, that she's led with the team. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, Chair. Um, I'm here with uh, with colleagues uh, from across the divide because this is uh, something that has been co-produced and uh, co-designed. And if we were to bring everybody, I think um, there would be uh, you know close to 40 members uh, just 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 presenting uh, around personality disorders. Um, um, members were um, were provided with the with the presentation we prepared uh, so that you know we could kind of like have uh, you know highlights for today. And, and, and focus more on um, on questions or areas of interest from members. So what I will do is just do a very quick highlight, uh, kind of like overview of the first few slides and then hand over to colleagues to, to, to also kind of like give highlights around their areas. Our focus today will be around one of the areas where we identified significant gaps and that was on the, on more on the treatment kind of like pathways. And that is what we're going to talk about today but uh, hopefully in the future we'll be able to come back now with everything neat, neat together, including the work that we need, we, we, we are yet to do, especially around the focus groups with our service users. So this piece of work around personality disorder sits uh, within um, the transformation program. And this is, um, you know, uh, 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 as guided also by our, uh, our long-term plan, which we are, we are currently trying to implement. And as, as, as we've said before, the long-term plan is not an NHS, um, you know, initiative on its own. It it requires everybody to kind of like, you know, come together so that we can have a different way of working to support the various and diverse needs that we have within our, our communities. So you will see as part of the presentation, the first few slides will be demonstrating what our transformation program is across the system. We've got three key transformation areas. One that covers everything under, that would respond to crisis and the urgent and emergency care. The work we are, we are doing around integrating care at place within our, our primary care networks and closer to people and where this piece of work actually sits around, you know, supporting people with personality disorders and wrapping care around, you know, in a very holistic way. And then the work we are we're doing around accommodation as well so that we have a mix of offers to meet different needs. These three transformation programs are very much so interdependent on each other because uh, the idea is this is not about pushing people from pillar to post or, you know, you know, um, you know, kind of like um, different agencies kind of like handing over or handing off and so on and so forth. This is about how we look at people's needs based on the level of complexity and what they're coming with and who will be best placed to, my, to support them at, 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 at any one particular time. So I won't go into actually describing the various details because we've done this in a very first way. So the first phase was actually just getting a baseline, getting the data, trying to understand what is going on. And we did this with a lot of support also from Maria in public health to help us actually make sense of what the data was saying, both from our caseloads and what uh, you know we get kind of like from a population um, uh, 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 perspective. And uh, you know, there's a lot of training as well that went into it and uh, Vary will talk uh, and Kathleen will talk a, a little bit, a little more around that training. And then there's this big gap that we had around psychology where we had IAPT on one side and then you jumped over into psychology and nothing in between that, that left the, what you know, what's very nicely described as the missing middle, and that missing middle actually caters for about 60% of the people 
who did not have any kind of like support. And that is where Laura and, uh, and Richard came in to kind of like support us to make sure that we have that continuity from the very mild to the very complex end around the treatment for, uh, uh, elements of it. So I'll not just hand over to kind of like uh, Laura, Kathleen and, um, and, and Richard and, uh, and Valerie to kind of like take us through the various kind of like elements around the clinical uh, uh, pathways. Thank you very much, Jane. I think um, if I start, uh, I'm aware that people already have the slides, so I'll, I'll read from them. Well, not read from them, but use them to uh, guide um, what I'm presenting just now. So my name is Barry Donaldson. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist in EPUT. I'm also implementation lead for service transformation um, in personality disorders and complex needs, and have been working uh, closely with all my colleagues here um, and with Jane uh, in the, the delivery of the, the principles of this pathway that I'm about to describe, which I think are very aligned with the guiding principles in um, the, the Thurrock locality also. Um, so this is, it's a, an Essex-wide project um, in the first instance with, with broad principles about integration and working in partnership, um, about being needs-based, um, that meeting a range of complexity from least to most, which my colleagues Laura and, and Richard will come on to discuss in a bit more detail, and particularly no longer having um, a, a, a service in which um, delivery of care is siloed in order to try and move away from the tendency to have a refer on culture uh, and for our service users with very complex needs to, to slip between the net to have that cliff edge scenario. It's also um, one of our guiding principles is more generally about an upskilled workforce, which is identified in the competency framework for interventions for people with personality disorders. And it's to try and work towards having an awareness and capacity for delivering evidence based treatments across services um, rather than having uh, the gatekeeping that's often incurred as a result of a specialist service. Um, and, and my last point was about ease of transition. So it's about creating greater integration, better communication in order to have smoother transitions for our service users between services, particularly in relation to um, if their needs may need stepped up or stepped down on the basis of increased risk or complexity, which again, I know Laura and Richard are going to talk about in a little more detail. I think I said at the start, it's an Essex wide model, but these principles are sufficiently flexible to be able to adapt to the priorities of a locality, which is um, we've been engaged in the work with Jane around the complex care project to meet the needs of service users in Thurrock. Um, it's worth saying, I think, in terms of local priorities, it's an age inclusive model. I know that there's a, a, a local priority about um, older adult service provision. Um, there's no exclusion on the basis of age. And we actually my own background is in um, older adult psychology, and I, I am looking to try and address uh, the potential for age inequalities, for example, in the delivery of this model and making sure that older people's complex needs are, are also addressed. Um, it's also aligned with supporting a sustainable offer of psychological um, input for people with severe mental illness. Um, and it's, it's aimed at focusing on supporting systemic change at, at a local level. Um, it is a complex model because it's about change across the whole system. So I'm just going to share some highlights with you. And I would say um, I'm very happy to be available um, outside of this meeting to, to discuss details if, if people are interested or would like further information. But in the first instance, we have a, a newly funded specialist team. This team, it's worth me saying it, this, it's not a new service as such, it is about an integrated delivery of care across um, all parts of the system, but sitting almost at the top of that system with an, an oversight um, uh, and a, a, a role in working with the most complex of cases is a, a, spe a new specialist multidisciplinary team. The multidisciplinary team consists of psychotherapists, psychologists, a specialist social worker and two service user network managers. Um, we also have a family therapist who has a role not just in delivering family therapy, but in working with the system. So with peers, colleagues, teams and other providers to be able to think from a more um, in a more systemic way about the delivery of care for people with complex needs. And we also have a specialist psychotherapist with a very specific role in supporting transitions for young people um, between young people's services and working age adult services. Um, and she's very involved in looking at the transition protocols for young people to try and ease that transition. 
And um, we also had some increased resource, so new people um, employed into, into newly funded roles. In particular, we have um, a half-time personality disorder lead psychologist in, in each of our localities, so that includes a half-time in South West, as well as um, what we're describing as transitioning psychologists who have a specific role in supporting discharge from inpatient services. So um, supporting discharge for those who may be the most frequent users or, or have the, the longest bed stays um, following a pilot in, in a part of Essex that was very successful and demonstrated great efficacy. Um, one of the, the bedrocks of our, our model is the service user network. The service user network has a, a range of functions, um, not least an opportunity for um, the engagement with our service users um, in order to promote co-production in order to receive feedback, in order to help evaluate our services, um, as well as a co-development of training programmes and actually co-facilitation of training as we do at the moment. So our service users co-facilitate a package of personality disorders awareness training that we're delivering to all providers. Um, and we've also, with, with Jane's support, have developed with, um, the first paid peer support worker role within the trust, which is um, we're going to run a pilot in the, the southwest area um, of this peer support worker role, which will specifically support both the development of the service user network, the links that are being made actually between our own in the trust service user network and all other uh, service user groups um, that might be, for example, being um, located within uh, our partnership uh, partner providers sorry excuse me tripping over my words a little bit but also to support the development of other peer support worker roles so it's something of a pilot role that we're, we're in the process of developing the job description at the moment and we're really looking forward to recruiting to that post and then the final structure I wanted to mention is something that we've, we've described as the multi-agency forum at the moment but its role really is to um to have some sort of structure within which people from across um, the system, from different providers, so in, uh, including NHS, social care and uh, VCSE partners can come together to discuss the care and um, coordination of service users with the most complex needs to allow um, safe handovers and identify what specific care needs are. And I think that's in recognition that people with complex needs um, often have needs that are over and above perhaps a therapeutic intervention or indeed a health intervention. Um, and I think uh, Laura can talk a little bit more about that with Richard about the um, developments towards that structure within uh, South West. I'm just gonna hand over to Cathy who's going to talk a little bit about the clinical developments. You're on mute, Lovely. Sorry about that. And I even reminded myself. Um, if I could start on the right hand side there with structured clinical management and mentalization based therapy. Um, these are both evidence based interventions. They're both nice guidance recommend recommended. Uh, mentalization based therapy is a psychotherapy as I say, NICE guidance is recommending, and structured clinical management is more um, what uh, Anthony Bateman, one of the senior developers of this model, what he calls a generalist intervention. Um, what's really useful about the structured clinical management is the way that it, it is possibly going to free up um, the pressure on moving clients through to specialist services. It's the psychologically based intervention. It's a problem solving based intervention. And it's one that is going to be, and one of the things I'll be doing is supporting our CMHT colleagues to offer this intervention. It works on a model of both group and individual sessions, and it targets some of the key difficulties that our clients with a, a PD diagnosis or with complex needs um, and emotional difficulties. It, it, target specifically those presentations and, and hones in on working in a, pro, I say, a problem solving way to deal with those things. The mentalization based therapy is more a psychotherapy intervention. Um, and we could consider the, the fundamental of it, looking at and supporting the individual to be able to reflect on their emotional states and reflect on the emotional states of the other that they're in, engage, in engagement with. Um, and this is 
really supporting things like emotional dysregulation, sensitivity in relationships, and both particularly work, of course, with impulsivity and with risk. Um, so it's it's two two different interventions, but um, both clinical, psychologically orientated interventions. And as I say, both group and individual provision in there. The other thing that we do is joint working with complex cases. So this could be, um, uh, as Barry alluded to, it might be supporting the team, it might be supporting care workers, but it's involving uh, our own our, a clinical intervention as well as supporting the system, the client and the system, be that their family and the, the um, professional system. I'm going to inv um, invite Laura and Vari, for that matter, to comment with me on steps in DBT. That's not been the area I have been as involved with, um, but certainly we've been doing a lot of training in both the steps and DBT provision, and that's been further developed. Laura, could I ask you to step in and say anything yeah, else sure, there? Sure. So, um, step, the step, so steps um, and DBT, they're both... Um, in st group interventions for um, emotionally unstable personality disorder um, and they're, they're interventions at different levels so um, STEPS is a less, a less intense um, intervention for people that are less dysregulated um, and DBT is for people that are much more dysregulated um, and really struggle to, to kind of rationalise um, and so we there's been a lot of training around delivering that for the staff group, um, training them up both in terms of in um, more specialist care in EPA, but also through the system as well. So we can talk a bit about more about that in terms of step four when Richard and I present on that. But um, there's there's a lot more provision in primary care as well. So we've been training up staff to um, to facilitate steps groups in primary care as well. So. Um, it, this isn't just about training up people in secondary care. This is training up the whole system to deliver interventions for this client group so that um, people don't have to escalate into crises in order to access interventions. And that's the key for this client group because that's been reinforcing then their presentations going forward. So um, I think that, does that cover um, what we've been... And, and also in terms of DBT coherent consults. So... Um, for DBT, um, you have to have a consult um, which involves um, a, a space of reflection and, supervi and supervision um, a space for your clinicians that are running it. Obviously, you, you can imagine it's quite a difficult client group to work with. It can be quite intense. Um, it can bring up a lot of emotions in yourself. So it's very important that you that you become co um, coherent to the model um, and provide those spaces for those clinicians. And that hadn't been in place. So we've ensured that that is in place and that's being provided um, with adequate supervision for the staff that are providing these groups that are incredibly difficult at times to provide. Thanks, Laura. And I, th I think ju just I'm just going to talk a little bit about training before handing over to Laura and Richard again. Um, the, the specialist team that I described um, when, when I began talking, um, it, it has a, a direct clinical function in that um, all members will carry a caseload, do carry a caseload of the um, the most complex of presentations, I, I guess, um, that might sometimes be the, the, the types of service user whose presentations are so complex that they might historically have sought out of area referrals, for example. So there's a function in um, addressing and managing directly the needs of the most complex of cases. Um, as Cathy and Laura have both described, um, there's been such a lot of integrated working that we've been able to achieve so far. So the DBT and steps that, that Laura was just describing is has been a, a great collaboration between some members of the, the specialist team, which forms part of the specialist arm of the pathway, but also is um, representative of, of one of the real priorities of the model, which is to make sure that people are able to deliver um, evidence-based interventions at all for all levels of, of complexity and really building capacity. I think it's, it's worth stressing that we are constantly building capacity into the system, which I know Laura is going to talk a bit more about as well. But a third function of the, the specialist team before I hand over to Laura um, is 
I guess, in essence, upskilling other parts of the system, so supporting through the provision of training. Some of that's about project management of training. There's a big NHS England offer related to the, the psychological therapies SMI agenda, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and that does take requires quite some project management because there's a significant offer of therapies training for people across the system just now. But not just coordination of that, there's also... Um, the team has been delivering its own uh, sort of in-house training. So we've developed um, a one day personality disorders awareness training, a half day and a, a two hour modular training. And these are, are aimed at clinical staff, non-clinical. So the half day might be aimed at administrative staff, for example. Um, and the two hour session um, is, is really aimed at GPs. And we're hoping to be able to present at time to learn sessions. This has been slower, I think, understandably and certainly from joining this meeting from the start, clearly uh, there's been a significant amount of, of transformed working within our, our GP surgeries throughout the last year and a half. Um, but this is, is something that we're certainly exploring with our GP commissioners. Um, so we've already trained, actually, that this is a slightly out of date slide, we've trained more than 275 staff from the trust and other uh, service providers by now. At the time of this slide, which is, is about a month old, 86% of our attendees were from Mid and South Essex. Um, as Cathy said, we've trained an additional 70 staff in structured clinical management and are looking to support the rollout of that. Um, and then just a final mention of, of uh, funding from the model has trained 17 staff in family connections, which is a, a dialectical behaviour therapy informed um, group for family members to, to learn about and, and support their loved ones with, with complex emotional needs that might meet criteria for PD. I'll stop talking now and hand over to Laura and Richard. Thank you. Thanks, Vari. So um, we, we'll zoom through this. I know you've, um, you've only allocated a, a little bit of time for us, so we won't take up too much more of your time. But um, I'm Laura Addis, um, just to introduce myself. I'm head of service for adult community psychological services in, in the southwest of Essex for EPA, which obviously covers Thurrock. And Richard, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Richard Pagoni. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm the PD psychologist. Oh, we couldn't hear you very well there, Richard. Oh. <laughs> it's all right. I, I think it... Well. No, I can now. I think it's... Was, yeah, that's fine. So we're just going to go through um, the model for step four, um, which was, was really... Uh, sorry to, to cut in. Can we sort of uh, wrap you up a little bit? We're running a short time. Yeah, so we're just gonna we're just gonna as I said we'll speed through it. So the rationale for step four was was really to think about what what Jane really mentioned there, which is the missing middle in the population. So those people that fell between secondary care services and IAP services. Um, and through the transformation plan, we, we, we recognise that a number of those patients were actually those that sat under what we would class as cluster seven, which was those that had a diagnosis of emotionally unstable personality disorder that sat under psychiatrists caseload but really the psychiatrists were reviewing them maybe once or twice a year and not really managing the risk but offering no other intervention and what they really needed was a psychological intervention but no one could offer that to them because they weren't severe enough for secondary care and they weren't um, they weren't meeting the the criteria and access targets for um, IAPT. So um, step four was there therefore invented and commissioned. Um, so what we worked on was um, referral criteria for step four, um, we, which was co-produced um, with um, two providers. So um, inclusion was was commissioned to provide step four. So we we worked together as as those two providers to to ensure that we had the agreement and partnership working between us and ensure that the flow between services worked and that um, the criteria was, was set and appropriate between, between the providers. I'll hand over to Richard. Thank you. Um, so in addition to that, what we then did is we took that model that was co-produced between the services to two different service user organisations. So the service user network from EPUT has already been um, talked about this evening and we took the design to, e to that group along with some questions that we had for them around how we can 
construct this model to best serve the people that are in it. And we got some fantastic feedback, which was very useful. Um, and we also took it to students of the Recovery College who had used similar services as well. Um, again, I'm mindful that you have the presentation and I'm mindful of time. Um, so we have, there's one slide there that tells you about what the offer is in a nutshell. What we were thinking is having a variety of different types of therapies available. So we'd be increasing access to multiple types of psychological therapy as opposed to one type. So we have a variety of one to one offer on offer for, for clients in our team, in addition to several group offers as well, which fits in um, with what's already being offered at secondary care. So, for example, steps has already been mentioned. We have a primary care version of steps, which is shorter and again designed for those to implement strategies sooner so that their mental state doesn't hopefully does not deteriorate. Um, and then we, it also means that in, in secondary care we can focus on the more complex end of the of the spectrum and that means that actually that we're not clogging up um, waiting lists with people that don't need to access our services um, and, and we can offer what we need to offer in terms of complexity in, in secondary care. Go ahead uh, Richard, sorry. No, thank you. Um, I guess to hopefully sum this up a little bit, um, I think as, as the introduction of step four has come into the thoric system, what I think has been quite useful is how, um, how we've organised psychological referrals from our colleagues into the various psychological teams. And that's really centred around the weekly professionals meeting that we have in Thurrock. So we've moved away from paper referrals and all referrals are discussed verbally with the people that are referring them. And the bonus to this is that we're not then getting uh, multiple referrals that are CC to various teams and we can agree there and then each week where a potential client would need to go by, which team they would need to be seen by. We feel this is beneficial because if there are, if we're not quite sure, we have the discussion there and then with all the relevant representatives um, of the thoric talking therapy services and we can decide then and there. Whereas before, perhaps it would take a long time to go for emails, discuss, you know, that sort of stuff. We're doing it then and there. Um, and this is working so well, in fact, that we're getting interest from different regions of asking how we're doing it um, and talking about how we can implement it in other, in other areas. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm going to have to jump in for that. Um, I can tell you've worked really hard on this and you're all so passionate about this mm -hmm. and you've taken a lot of time to, to write this report. It, it's a really interesting report. You know what? You are plugging a gap that has been neglected for such a long time. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, it's, I commend you for it, it's brilliant. You know, what, what you're aiming to, to achieve and the changes that you're, you're saying that you can bring are fantastic. I think when we look at the report as a whole, it's gonna be that thing of reviewing it in six months time, a year's time, when it comes out, see how we've made it, see what impact you've made. So could you just quickly take me through, say, you get someone that comes to you with uh, an eating disorder. What is the process they would go through and what ch how that would have changed from before to now? Who would you like to answer that? Should, should I go through that? So e eating disorders services are separate to these services. So this is specifically for personality disorders. So eating disorders services, of, I think Jane can answer in terms of commissioning for that, have had additional resources put in for commissioning um, because, because of the speciality related to that. So um, I, th I think that's a completely separate pathway, which we could actually provide a completely different presentation for it in itself. Um, but if, if, in, if in terms someone came through our pathway with a, emotion, a, a diagnosis of emotional stable personality disorder, or for example, had traits where they were really dysregulated, actually what we would do is we would take that to the discussion at, at the multi-agency team, or multidisciplinary team, whichever you want to call it, and we would then decide at that team where would be they'd be best placed to be for their needs to be met and what intervention would be best to meet that and it may be that we won't be able to decide an intervention at that point it may be that they need to be assessed to decide that and to 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 make more clearer decisions but it would be clear that that would be the best service for them at that time and a more specialist assessment would then take place without then having to have an assessment and then they go no and then they have assessment and go no and they get battered backwards and forwards and 
have a really awful experience. And that's the difference in terms of the, the model that we're, we're, we're delivering now. Thank you. I did select that disorder knowingly that it wasn't covered in that remit, but knowing also it can lead to other complex disorders and behavioural problems. Um, it, it wasn't meant to be a totally trivial question, but the other thing is, you did mention upon training. Are, your, are, the, are you all trained for this now? Are all your staff ready for this to go, or is it a continual training pro, a program that you're rolling out? It, it's a continual um, rolling program of training. Um, the, the, some of the training is, is made available to system partners via uh, marketing. So, um, for example, the, the awareness training, which has, has proved hugely um, popular, I suppose is the right word. Um, we, we now are establishing one full day and we're looking to establish one half day every month and to make that available. It's all delivered via MS Teams the wonders of technology so we're able to um, host a significant number of um, of uh, delegates at a time so that's a rolling program the NHS England offer which is in specialist therapies such as, as dialectical behaviour therapy uh, family interventions um, specialist CBT that's a rolling offer um, that, that we are repeatedly sort of scoping needs um, and then there is a, a year on year rolling budget that's linked to the, um, the, the business case, the funding that, that we have from commissioners um, that we can uh, evaluate the, the greatest need and use with system partners. So, for example, there's the potential to offer training in specialist interventions like EMDR, um, which is something that we're having discussions with, with some system partners in a different part of the trust, or sorry, a different part of Essex at the moment, but I use it by way of example. It's something that we would also be discussing um, in, in South West with colleagues. So yeah, that's very much a, a rolling programme. And I think given the, the nature of our services and, and the staffing of our services will continue to be. Thank you. Uh, just going back on something you did mention earlier on, I'm really happy you're moving away from email and uh, a letter form of referrals and that you are, you're, you're meeting to discuss these. I think this is just a much more accurate way going forward. I just find it open to any other members if they've got any other questions. Uh, Councillor Piccolo. <clears throat> just a point looking at your presentation, um, paperwork that you've given out. Um, there's so many acronyms in here, and I haven't got a clue what they mean Although in some instances I have been able to read through and worked out what it stands for. If I could just suggest if you put out a complex report like this in the future, you actually put an appendix with all what the acronyms stand for. You use them every day. We don't. So it's just a, a point, of, uh, point of information for you. Thank point you. Well That's made, very yeah. good feedback. Thank you. Yeah. I would admit I was looking some up before I come in. <laughs> Councillor Polly. Thank you, Chair. Um, just looking on the back page of the presentation, the algorithm uh, for the pathway starts with a GP. We've just had a, quite a, an intense conversation with our CCG about availabilities of, and, and especially people that are suffering with, with uh, anxiety or possible personality disorders, I mean, a, a telephone conversation um, at, at the moment, I, it gives me a great concern that that's the trigger to access your services. Um, I also, I'm not sure, it, it's adult services, and I know you do marvellous work and you can't encompass everybody, but especially in our younger people, we do have this increasing multiple personality disorder problem um, and I, I don't know there was nothing in there about cams about you really uh, how you interact with them when when a young adult sort of trans transverses over to another service if they if that's automatic do or do they have to go through a referral system again is there a, a safety net for them and Again, with um, mental health services, are you a Monday to Friday, nine to five, and are you 
based in one location or, or because very often when people are in need of these services, it's, it's outside of uh, normal working hours. Thank you. Can I answer a few of those questions? So um, the, the first one in terms of the GP being the referrer, uh, the referrer. So people can access the GP. And one of the new things that's been introduced into the PCNs is a, is a first contact practitioner or, or assessor into the um, PCNs. Um, and they are mental health um, practitioners. They're trained in mental health um, difficulties. So if the, if the person goes through to the GP um, and they need um, assistance with their mental health, they can have an appointment, ne not necessarily needing to go to the GP, but can go straight to the mental health practitioner. And the mental health practitioner can then assess, and they do a longer assessment than the GP because it's more specialist assessment, and they can refer direct to us or direct a step four, they even can come into the multidisciplinary team to talk about their assessment and talk about their case. So it wouldn't need necessarily that they have to access the GP. It's just we're saying GP or PCN. So it could be um, um, it could be that they've seen the GP and the GP has concerns and that they then need to make that referral. Or it could be that they've seen the mental health practitioner within the PCN and they're referred that way. Um, in in terms of the access through CAMS, I, I know that Vari and Cathy mentioned about there being a, a, a new practitioner within their team. I'll let them talk about that. Can I just jump in just quickly? Can I just ask Mark, is this correct, this information we're getting, that these practitioners are in our surgeries now? Um, yes, we've invested in um, uh, three practitioners in each of the PCNs, uh, so different grades uh, of, uh, of workers, of mental health workers, so that we have um, yeah, a comprehensive mental health offer um, operating in, in primary care. So yeah, that is uh, alongside the, the work that's happening here, we are also investing in the mental health capacity in primary care too. Whereabouts are they based, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I'll bring Jane in for the kind of details of how many workers we've actually got into in post. Um, I'll hand over to Jane. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, as Mark has said, each PCN is going to have an integrated team, as, as Mark has said, of different um, uh, kind of like uh, bonding. And this also includes peer support workers who are, who are going to be, who are, um, uh, who are from Farrock Mind, in each PCN. So each team, each PCN or each primary care network will have a team of about four mental health professionals supported by a consultant. So we're waiting to start having consultant clinics starting really in, in, in quarter four, once we've, we've, we've stabilized um, the outpatient caseloads and, and once we've let uh, Laura and, uh, and Richard's team kind of like now manage um, the psychological kind of like uh, uh, um, elements of that, and Catherine it, through the the the, C, uh, the the whatever the community uh, led support teams are supporting us with the social elements of, of this, with Tharok Mind providing a little bit more hands on. So eventually, all these integrated teams are now actually in post, but they have not completely embedded. So some, um, one or two of the primary care networks do not have the full complement. Uh, uh, you know, as such, but we are con continuously recruiting and hopefully by the end of this financial year, we should have all the teams in place. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to pass you over to Vice Chair Councillor Hodaway. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, yes, I mean, we, we I, I did receive this report yesterday and unfortunately wasn't able in that time frame to, to look at it properly. So I think that was kind of the first um, problem for me. Um, I, I think what I understood from the report Report, um, was good. I can see, as the chair said, that the extraordinary amount of work has gone into this and everyone is extremely passionate and knowledgeable ab about this. Um, I do hope, and I'm, I'm sure this will, and I hope the pathway will, will make 
residents journey better. Um, however, I am still concerned and a little bit confused about um, where the mental health staff actually are. Do we have them? Yes or no? And if we do, where exactly are they? Are, are they so that I can we can say to um, people to direct them where to go to to get in to see them? I, I'm that that's really confused me. Um, I would echo as well um, councillors' points about acronyms. Having sat on the committee for years, um, me looking at this, I, I, it was a bit. I didn't really make a lot of sense from it. I found it very difficult, and we do have. Um, three or well, four new members of the committee, but one, uh, three brand new members to, to the health area. So I, if I found it difficult, I can't imagine what it was like sitting through it for, for new members. So whilst being mindful of uh, we, not speaking to councillors like we're fools, managing how it's presented to us, because as we say, we don't hear these acronyms every day. Um, I was, a, I found it hard to follow the presentation, if I'm honest. I my question, I think, as well, getting to a question after all those points is, so phase, there's a phase one, two, and three, and then a step four. Is that phase four? Because I, I missed step one, two, and three. Um, and if that is phase four, um, where are the time, the exact timeline? So when are we expecting the phases to kind of come in, and when are we seeing this? So, yeah, overall, um, brilliant work, but probably I'm, I'm still quite confused about it all but so thank you thank you chair um so can we have clarification on where they're based and if they are actually active in post now and timelines please and timelines thank you chair if i can take uh, uh where the mental health uh, professionals are based they're all based in, in, in within the surgery, so they, there's a rota on which which surgery they will be at in in in, in each um, uh, kind of like um, uh, you know every day. They're already in post within the surgeries, but within kind of like the 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 the, the primary care network, so that it, uh, you know each surgery is clear when when patients can can, can go and uh, and see them the mental health professionals. In terms of uh, Laura's and uh, and Richard's service, I will let them say. Uh, you know, uh, how that is accessed and how they're seeing patients. Can I just come back in? So, again, it's right. They, they rotate through the surgeries around yes. far. So, at one yes. point, they will be at each surgery that we, yes. we have. And we, do they provide dates? Do the appointment system work for them? Yes. It's just this is new information to us. I've, we've we've not actually heard of this before. I don't believe. Can I, can Vice Chair, can you just clarify? We've, we've not had this before. I, I I can't remember off the top of my head having. I I don't know if it's arrived and we the overload of information we haven't received it. But I don't remember having those dates or having that confirmation. But I'm also kind of concerned. Does that mean practically? Um, that you can only see someone on that, de like mental health issues don't wait. So you can't say, oh, well, I'll wait a week and a half till they come to my surgery and I can get an appointment. Um, and again, you know, as Councillor Polly raised the issue with getting a GP in the appointment in the first place. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still I'm still worried that that's kind of not been thought out properly. If, Chair, thank you. If I could, I, I could answer that. Um, we did not prepare for the integrated kind of like work we it's kind of like um we prepare for personality disorders but we're happy to do a presentation on the new model of care and provide um the, the full detail of how that service is going to work and how it is currently being implemented if that is all right uh Sorry, I, again, I, I'm I'm confused. I'm sorry. I, maybe maybe we should just move on from the item because I'm I'm confused between personality disorders and the mental health. Pers I thought we were talking about p people being in the surgery for personality disorders, not a wider mental health. I I don't know. I'm lost. I'm lost, Chair. I'm happy to move on because I, I don't think we're ever going to get there. Yeah, I, I think that we because you, your report covers so many areas because where people. Um, have complex issues. They are from all different areas, and how they're going to connect to the services. We know that some are going to self-refer to mind, and some go through doctor surgeries. You're going to have a lot of referrals. So it's a very broad picture there that I think we're trying to cover in one 
sort of five minute section what we were trying to get through. Um, I think what we'll do, if we've got any further questions, we'll, we'll forward them to you as an email. Okay. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Councillor Polly. Sorry, just, just one question um, before Chair moves on. Um, so, the referral via the IAPT, can, can that be any healthcare professional? Uh, if, if there is, I don't know, ambulance in attendance at a home, or if there is district nurses going into a home, or, or other people that would have a concern, um, do, do they have to refer them back to their GP first to, to then be referred to the IAPT or is it open to other HCPCs, please? Maybe I can um, come in to, for that one. Um, so I think to speak to the point which has been mentioned uh, a few times, um, I could appreciate the acronyms not being so helpful and that, that's something we'll take on board for next time, I expect. So IAPT uh, stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, um, and it's um, run by Inclusion Thurrock. Um, it's the primary care therapy service within Thurrock. Um, I think reflecting on this uh, model, I think there could have been a few extra things in here that hopefully have made, uh, explained it a little bit more. So a referral to that primary care therapy service, that IAPT, um, that can be um, self-referral. So anybody can pick up the phone and call us to self-refer. Um, it can also be done by any any healthcare professional that's had contact with someone that they think could benefit from a primary care therapy intervention. Um, but also, you know, we, we do encourage people to self-refer if they would like to have a therapeutic intervention. It's on this diagram in the context of being people from who are referred into IAPT if they might better uh, if they have needs that might be better served by the Step 4 service, we have an internal referral route from the IAP service into Step 4, um, which is fairly seamless because, we, you know, we're under the same umbrella organisation. I hope that answers uh, your question. Thank you again. So I very much appreciate that you've taken so much time on this report. If we do have any other questions, we'll certainly forward them on to you. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, item 10, tobacco control, joint needs assessment strategy. Uh, can I ask Joe Ballbent to present this item, please? Thank you, Chair. In fact, Bex Willans, um, our public health specialty registrar, will be presenting this. She's um, led on all this work and will be best placed to talk you through it. Good evening all and thanks for having me here at the HOSC this evening. I've prepared some presentation slides just to help um, make sure I cover the key messages and the key points um, in the tobacco control needs assessment. So hopefully you'll see my screen shortly. Joe, I can see your face. Can you nod when you can see that, please? Yes, okay, great. So, um, Yes, I am presenting here tonight the um, overview, really, of Thurrock Tobacco Control Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. Uh, joint Strategic Needs Assessment products essentially a collation of research evidence and data working with stakeholders to make sure we understand the extent to which needs on a particular topic, in this case tobacco control, are being met by our current service and policy approach and where there are opportunities to improve on that. Um, and it's very much part, um, the first step, if you like, in a process of improving services and addressing needs. Um, the information in this report will be used to prioritise work with stakeholders and members of the public to develop a tobacco control strategy. So this is sort of step one that I'm presenting this evening. And I wanted to start with just emphasising why tobacco control is important because the harm of cigarette smoking has been known for a long time. Cigarette smoking is the main form of tobacco used in the UK. Um, but perhaps because it's an, no longer a novel risk, um, its importance is, is sometimes forgotten. Um, it remains the main cause of premature death in the UK, which means it's the main cause of people dying under the age of 75. And of premature deaths, about half of those are what we call preventable deaths. And tobacco is also the main cause of preventable death in the UK. 
that means they're desperate that there's something we could have done if we'd intervened earlier to stop them happening. And we know with cigarette smoking that it is an addiction, it's not a lifestyle choice. Um, most smokers in this country want to quit. Um, most people who smoke will try to quit on their own. And yet the most effective means of quitting is through an evidence-based stop smoking service like the one we have in Thurrock. So it's important to do something because we can do something about it and it has a lot of harm. Um, but key to those two points above is those impacts are not distributed equally across our population. And smoking and tobacco control, har tobacco harm, sorry, generally is still the main cause of health inequalities. And just to illustrate the extent of that harm, there's evidence showing that um, a smoker in, a well in one of the wealthiest social classes will have poorer survival than a non-smoker in one of the poorer social classes. In other words, for all the impacts that deprivation and disadvantage might have on health, the harm caused by tobacco is stronger than those combined. Um, and given that smoking prevalence isn't distributed equally across our communities, it is that single biggest um, intervention we could do to support our levelling up agenda in terms of health impact. Now this slide shows where Thurrock compares currently to the England average and, and among other local authorities. You can see at, at present we have quite a high proportion of our population who smoke. That prevalence is reducing, although at a slightly slower rate than the, the national average. But what I really want us to focus on in this slide is Richmond-upon-Thames who have a smoking prevalence of 8.4%. And the reason that's important is the government have an ambition nationally to reduce smoking prevalence to 5% by 2030. So in less than nine years, if Thurrock to achieve that, we have a long way to go. We will need to look at opportunities to do things quite differently to get there. But what the data from Richmond upon Thames shows us is it is possible to have a population with, with that extent of low smoking prevalence. So it is possible. Not surprisingly, the higher smoking prevalence in, in, in Thurrock does impact on, on the health impacts we see. So we have 25% higher smoking attributable mortality. Um, it has impacts on health service use. So for example, we have 27% higher smoking attributable hospital admissions. But you also see that in, in, in primary care, people with long-term conditions and needing treatment for that. And we also have um, it impacts across people's life's lifetimes. So we have higher under 19 hospital admissions for asthma. And although those aren't all smoking attributable or caused by smoking, asthma is definitely one of those conditions that is quite badly affected by smoking and exposure to secondhand smoke. For, so for children, young people living in homes where there's a smoker, um, that will be contributing to that figure. Um, it was mentioned in the report for the HOSC that the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment took a whole systems approach. So we've tried to understand the harm caused by tobacco in, in different ways. And for example, with regard to the levelling up agenda, uh, in the UK, the average smoker at the moment smokes about 20 cigarettes a day, which currently costs almost £4,000 a year. Now, I'm also working on a housing affordability needs assessment for Thurrock. And from that analysis, I know that um, the rental shortfall at the moment for a universal credit allowance claimant in Thurrock looking for a one-bed apartment is about £1,872 per year. So we can see that for our smokers, whether they're in receipt of benefits or on low incomes, um, helping them even reduce the amount they smoke could help them into, for example, um, more secure, stable accommodation. So it's not just about the health impacts. There's also an economic impact in Thurrock. Um, after we account for the money collected in taxation, the annual deficit to the tobacco economy, to the Thurrock economy <laughs> caused by tobacco is 17.6 million. And as this diagram shows, most of that's borne out in productivity costs. And so there is an imperative to work with our local employers as well as public sector services to, to encourage them to help their staff who smoke to quit, to support staff to quit and make it easy for them to do so. I've mentioned healthcare costs, but there are other public sector service costs. For example, in Thurrock, it's estimated our adult social care bill associated with tobacco-related harms about 2.8 million. And a lot of that will be with, associated with the fact that people who smoke on average need to access adult social care about 10 years younger than those who don't. 
and also there's a cost associated with, for example, house fires. And although that's a relatively small figure, um, the, the challenge with house fires caused by cigarette smokes is they tend to be uh, more lethal than fires caused by other means. Now, what this slide is showing us is um, how the smokers in our population are distributed by um, quintiles of deprivation. In other words, we've ranked the 20 wards in Thurrock by the indices of multiple deprivation. One represents the most deprived and five the least. And what we can see is that 52%, so over half the smokers in Thurrock, live in our two most deprived quintiles. In other words, in the eight most deprived wards. And so strategically, there's an opportunity for Thurrock to, to reduce smoking prevalence, both at the scale we need to, but also um, reducing those inequalities across the socioeconomic uh, gradient. Some other priority groups we need to focus on in the next few years as we develop our tobacco control strategy include routine and manual workers. In Thurrock, they're over twice as likely to smoke as people in other um, occupations. People with mental illness in Thurrock are over two and a half times as likely to smoke. Um, there's been no significant change in that in the last five years. Um, there is still that inequality, but we have seen in Thurrock Stop Smoking Service an increase in people referring themselves or referred who um, declare they have a mental illness. Um, and they're having more success in quitting. So we have made some improvements, but we still need to address that inequality. With regard to smoking in pregnancy, Again, um, our local maternity provider have increased the number of referrals to the service, which is good news, but there are still one in 10 pregnant women in, in, in Thurrock who smoke, and this figure doesn't account for the partners or other household members of those pregnant women who smoke. And so we need to do more around that um, early intervention agenda to stop smoking-related harm at the earliest age. Among children and young people, Thurrock fares fairly well. We're performing at least as well, if not better, than the national average in terms of under 18s who smoke. Um, but this statistic I've, I've selected just shows that smoking is still an issue among children and young people. In Thurrock, at 15 years old, 3.6% of children have told their GP they smoke. They're recorded as a smoker. And that prevalence increases with age. And we know most smokers, lifetime smokers, start before the age of 18. So this is telling us there are still young people starting to smoke. This will be the tip of the iceberg, and it's not distributed um, you know, that way across our whole population. Um, so we need to do more and continue to work children, young people on this agenda. There's more we could do in our healthcare services to support people with long-term conditions who smoke. Not surprisingly, a higher proportion of smokers in Thurrock have at least one long-term condition. For example, over a quarter have asthma, 12.3% have chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or another respiratory illness. And both of those are ones that are made worse by smoking. So it's not just a case of healthcare services referring smokers to the Stop Smoking Service, but indeed recognising smoking as part of the treatment portfolio or, or treatment offer for those, for those people because it will help um, reduce their symptoms and it can help improve the efficacy or effectiveness of their treatment. And we have a blind spot for some of our protected characteristics groups where we know nationally smoking prevalence is, is either higher or more nuanced. So for example, we know um, among BME populations, um, there are differences in the extent of smoking by gender um, and the type of tobacco use. So we need to do more work locally to better understand needs in those groups and um, that are currently hidden. Now, this slide presents um, the result of some modelling, which uh, I, I won't bore you or go into the, the full detail of, but essentially Professor Robert West um, has done a lot of research looking at different interventions to reduce smoking prevalence and uh, created a model that we've been able to apply to Thurrock. And what it tells is if you look at that yellow line that uh, moves down to the 2037 um, uh, date, um, is that the single most effective intervention we can do to reduce smoking prevalence in Thurrock is to increase quit attempts among our smokers. Um, the red hashed line represents uh, the progress towards the 2030 target, in other words, where we need to be in terms of the number of smokers. And although that yellow line says increase quit attempts by 50% and improve quit success by 50%, you can change the quit success 
um, obviously that's important too in terms of people you know attempting to quit and managing to do so successfully but ultimately it is that quit attempt getting more people into the service that is going to help us and um, reduce our smoking prevalence in Thurrock the most. And so moving to the recommendation themes of the needs assessment report and um, just reiterating what I've just said mainly we need to be getting more smokers to attempt to quit through the stop smoking service and we need a whole system response to do that to make sure that those smokers who are not currently engaged or thinking about quitting and um, are aware of the opportunities to do so and we focus those efforts on high priority groups um, so while we need to continue with what we call a universal stop smoking service offer in other words there are smokers in every ward in the borough we need to make sure that all of those are supported to quit we need to do more around uh, areas of deprivation routine and manual workers so for example engaging employers of routine and manual workers to develop smoke free policies and supporting their staff to quit uh, work with our mental health services to embed support for smoking cessation across patient pathways it's not just about a referral at the end of that but looking at it um, where appropriate as part of the treatment offer and there's work around the long-term plan funding nationally to, to address that and so too is the NHS long-term plan fund being used to look at um, addressing tobacco control for people's long-term conditions, addressing acute healthcare services, um, incorporating smoking treatment during a patient's stay, and we're working with Public Health England and other partners locally to look at the, the pathway at the end of that stay as well into our stop smoking service. And we're also looking at primary care through um, payment incentives, basically something called stretch quaff. Um, uh, asking our GPs to ask smokers with a long-term condition about whether or not they smoke and making sure they offer them support and, and referral into our service. And more broadly, there are other interventions uh, picked up, um, one of them being localised marketing and communications opportunities. Um, that's one of the most effective things we can be doing to try and stop young people um, in particular taking up smoking so we can work with the Brighter Futures Strategy Board, for example, to identify opportunities to include tobacco control and vaping within the health offer for children. Uh, we need to work with the voluntary community sector and the public to co-produce stop smoking solutions for our priority groups. Um, we've acknowledged that uh, working with the collaborative communities team in Thurrock Council, not as a one-stop um, engagement exercise, which might seem a little tokenistic, but as part of an ongoing approach to developing the tobacco control strategy based on the findings in this report to make sure those priority groups have an opportunity to truly influence um, and we adapt the services to, to their needs. And finally, Thurrock Council, Thurrock CCG and other partners locally should be working with our providers and services to properly evaluate local tobacco control interventions and make sure we adapt and respond as appropriate because when it comes to priority groups, there is a lack of research evidence on what's most effective. And so we need to be responsive and flexible to what we're learning locally and what we're testing. And so next steps. As I've mentioned, based partly on feedback from the HOSC uh, committee this evening, uh, we will be writing the tobacco control strategy and we'll be doing that, as I say, using the needs assessment as a basis uh, of our evidence, but also collaborative, collaborative. We will be collaborating with services, commissioners, voluntary community sector and businesses to strengthen our recommendations, being clear on who is going to do what to fill those gaps. Um, and of course, co-produce solutions with members of the public. Um, and finally, we'll be undertaking exploratory work with groups where there are currently blind spots. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Bex. Um, I guess for you, now the work really starts. You've presented and created a really solid baseline for, for your work in the future. Um, this is a brilliant piece of work. Um, again, you know, we personally always get sceptical about how many people admit they smoke or don't smoke. But this is comprehensive. You know, your groundwork is solid here. And you know, we can take away from this and you know, we can really see where we can improve or where you can improve and really have something to market against. Uh, I think it's brilliant. Uh, Councillor Holloway. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's an absolutely um, brilliant report, as always, from the public health team. Um, a, a fantastic JSNA report, uh, really, really detailed, really well evidenced, really well presented. So a huge, huge thank you uh, for that. Um, two questions. The first, how much money do we currently invest um, in our kind of stop smoking programmes, bearing in mind the, like, the real importance that's been flagged in this issue? Um, and secondly, like... Um, um, oh, how long have we had those programmes in place for? I realise, obviously, next steps are to change what we've been doing. Um, I, I, my question, I guess, is how long have we had those in place? Have we been, I guess, trying to do the same same thing for years now, expecting different results? And I can see, obviously, from, from this report, that will change and we're going to try new things. But what's happened up until now? Thanks. I can answer the second part of your question. I don't know if Joe can answer the first about the total <laughs> cost of <laughs> yeah. And um, with regard to kind of what have the what have we been doing with our stop smoking services um, and, and the tobacco control approach in direct for the last few years. So um, in the time of the last strategy, which is the last five years. Um, Thurrock have had a stop smoking service which has adapted so for example um, the service is now has now been brought in house is delivered by Thurrock Healthy Living Service and that was in response to um, poor performance um, and actually some of those improvements we've seen in terms of engagement of people with with mental ill health um, and improvement of our of our quit success have happened since we've brought the service in house and also they've diversified the, the, the offer, the stop smoking service offer. Um, for example, we now have two vape shops um, offering smoking cessation support. There are pharmacies. So there's there's multiple options and it is being adaptive. But I think where we could improve is better um, evaluating and responding in a timely way to, to what local evaluation tells us. And also working with the local market um, at the moment, to some extent, we're, we're limited in terms of where those services are based because... We, we haven't had the response from the market in terms of um, smoking cessation provider places, if you like, that that, that service could be delivered. Um, but yes, in the short answer is the service has responded and adapted over time. But I think we can go a little bit further, particularly around those priority groups and, and mainly how we engage them, how we how we um, co-produce with those priority groups to to to, to make sure the service offer truly does meet their needs. Um, jo, are you able to answer the finance question? So it, I don't have a, you know, the, I don't have a, a single figure answer that I can give you off the top of my head because as Bex has explained, we've got a mixed, um, a multiple um, offer around smoking cessation. So we have an in-house service um, that was staffed in-house um, and if we just consider the staffing of that it, it's um, it's a cost of over £200,000 per year and that's just the staffing cost. There's obviously the cost of um, the materials and things on top of that. We also, as Beck says, have a we have vape shops in the area and we also commission um, Allen Cars Easy Way. So we have a variety of types of stop smoking support uh, to maximise quits, which, as Bex has said, is really important. The um, the external contracts are also around two hundred thousand pounds per year, um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the spend. Um, I can't give you an exact figure. Um, yeah, no, that, right that's now. fine. Sorry, I, I sh it's very mean to to actually like like um, yeah to expect you to know figures off the top of your head and like just ask that question and just yeah. And no, that's absolutely no fine. Getting that kind of wider context, that's that's fine. And yeah, sorry for being mean and asking detailed finance questions off the hoof. Uh, Councillor Fish. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm particularly interested in services for young people, trying to stop them from even starting smoking or um, help them to, to stop smoking. And it mentions in the report about um, a service whereby it involves um, peers and family as well. So can you give me a bit more detail about how that service works? Um, I think that's one of the recommendations. So at the moment in our children, young people's um, service offer, there was a program called Assist that was commissioned a number of years ago to work on peer support um, among children and young people. 
Um, but evaluation of that um, service offer found that it wasn't cost effective. It's ex extremely costly and partly impacted by the fact that we, because we have sm low smoking prevalence among children and young people in thorough demonst demonstrating cost effectiveness is quite difficult. And that's why in this needs assessment, we've reviewed the evidence to look at what's the, what does the current research say is most effective. And that's where we've drawn on this idea of Firstly, we need mass media communications and, and to some extent work with schools and existing structures like the Brighter Futures um, uh, uh, structure to make sure that all children, young people get that message that smoking is not good <laughs> and also to balance that message around harm reduction because we do know more children, young people are taking up vaping. There's no evidence nationally that that is leading to an increase in them then taking up smoking. In fact, we see the opposite trend, but we need to keep an eye on the message we give children, young people, all children, young people on that respect. Um, but the evidence also indicates to us that we need to be doing much more, um, as you've mentioned, Councillor, um, to work with families where uh, we know there are parents in the household who smoke and target our services, for example, uh, young offenders and young people who we pick up in um, the Brighter the Future survey who are engaged in a number of risky behaviours. So there are certain populations of children and young people that are likely to be in touch with council and other service services where we should be screening, we should be checking if they're smoking or exposed to smoke and trying to offer support and advice to them early. Um, so sorry if that was not, not clear in the report. Okay, that's, that's um, <coughs> encouraging. Thanks very much. Um, just wanted to ask as well, uh, you both mentioned vaping. Um, now, um, I presume it's better than smoking because there's not so many harmful substances involved. There's still nicotine involved in that. So is the eventual aim with the vape shop and things like that to actually uh, stop them from even vaping? I can contribute, Joe, and then if you want to say anything else on this, I'll let you. Um, so uh, at the moment, the engagement with the vape shop is recognition that um, I mentioned earlier in my presentation that most smokers will attempt to quit without support from the Stop Smoking service. Um, but a lot of there's an increase in smokers who are trying to quit th using e-cigarettes through vaping. Um, what what evidence tells us is that they are more likely to be successful in that quit attempt and to quit cigarette smoking altogether if they do so with behavioural support as well, which is what they will get from the stop smoking service. So by combining the two, we're combining the most effective means of quitting with the most popular. And that's part of our current harm reduction strategy, because as you've identified, Councillor, the harm caused by smoking is so great and our smoking prevalence is still so high that at present we need to do something to support smokers to stop smoking. And given that so many people will vape anyway, what we're in effect doing is offering support for those considering vaping um, with a more full offer, if you like, with, the, with, with that behavioural support combined. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Joe. No, I think you've covered it. I mean, it's a harm minimisation approach that we're taking. Vaping is not without risk, but the risks are significantly lower than, than cigarette smoking is better, certainly. OK, thank you. Right, OK, come in. I'm going to challenge you. Thorough should continue to fund its stop smoking services, explore opportunities to improve access in eight wards, contributing to over half the above smokers. Now, we're talking at 40... Was it 49.7% or something like that? Um, why the deprived areas and not the non-deprived areas? Can you fight me a cause on that? Um, so I'm recommending what, what we call in, in public health, I'll, I'll throw some jargon at you, but then explain what it means. So we, we call some, um, the approach is called proportionate universalism, which basically means that everyone in the population should have access to some degree of support. So in Thurrock, we currently offer um, stop smoking services to every resident, and, and we're recommending that continues. But what we are saying is where we look in the next five years to target resources and do things especially differently should be in those more deprived wards because um, those smokers will be experiencing poor health due to other factors linked to deprivation and disadvantage. And so the potential health gain in those groups is, is, is larger. And also because just on a numbers game, over half of our smokers live in those areas. So, so it is that 
opportunity to address the scale of the issue to some extent, but also focus it on, on the areas where we think we can make most gain in terms of health impact. I hope that answers your question without being too technically uh, <laughs> jargony. No, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Sorry, thank you. Now, I think, again, just overall, it's a brilliant report. Any other questions from any other members? No? Um, thank you again, and I wish you all luck pushing forward with this and uh, hope to see uh, some big changes coming. Thank you. Me too, and thanks very much for having me this evening. Okay, uh, to extend the meeting, is that correct? Got a quarter of an hour. Uh, I think Joe will be okay with 15 minutes for a COVID report update. It will just be my questions that hold us up. <laughs> okay, Joe. Uh, item 11 is that then? Uh, can I ask Joe to present her COVID update, please? Thank you, Chair. And yes, I can definitely do my bit in less than 15 minutes. So um, let's see how we go. Can you see my screen? I think you can. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to run through some some slides uh, showing you the current status uh, of COVID in Thurrock uh, and also the sort of history of where we've been uh, for comparison. Oh. So current picture. For the past few weeks, our rates have been hovering just below 250 per 100,000 uh, residents. Um, for to just give you some sort of comparison scale there, back in January we had 1,500 cases per 100,000 residents, uh, but back in sort of May time we were about 10. So so we're sort of at a median level at the moment, um, and it's staying fairly fairly level. And as you can see from this graph here, our neighbouring boroughs are all mostly at a very similar level to us. There seems to be a, a sort of consistent picture. Um, within within South Essex and within our, our neighbours. Um, one thing to note here, the, the scale on the side positivity is that the percentage of tests that we do that are positive. This has stayed also steady at around uh, around 7%, but again, a couple of months ago, that was down at 1%. So, so it has changed considerably over the past few months. Um, that's illustrated on this slide here. So this is our overall uh, positive tests. So you, this is the big uh, spike we had back uh, at New Year. And you can see here we're sort of fairly flat for the, the past few weeks. Um, and also this black line here is the positivity rate and that is staying quite flat as well. Our tests, uh, test rates have gone up as you might imagine in the past couple of months, uh, but again, it's sort of leveled off. This is the current age profile of those we know are positive with COVID in Thurrock. Um, for the past few months, again, we've seen a pattern where the highest uh, case rates have been in this 10 to 19 and 20 to 29 age group. Um, we've had a little spike in the 40 to 49s um, in this week, but consistently we are seeing the sort of 10 to 29 age group is where we're getting the highest cases. And obviously among the teenagers, they'll be going back to school in the next week. So we, we just need to keep a bit of an eye on that. You'll notice we've got very low rates in our over 60s, but we do have some cases in the over 60s. This was extremely low um, earlier in the summer. Um, but unfortunately, it has risen slightly, but it's much lower than it was, obviously, kind of this uh, it, last year. This is the COVID bed occupancy in BTUH. So this is both Thurrock and non-Thurrock uh, residents. You can see sort of back in May, June time, there were no COVID patients. Uh, this has gone up again in the past couple of months, sadly. Uh, and you can see from the sort of the pink and black lines at the bottom, we have got a few patients, unfortunately, in ITU now, although the most patients are just on oxygen therapy rather than invasive ventilation. I've added in um, a slide just to uh, talk about the, sadly, we've had 489 COVID deaths in Thurrock, and I thought it was worth us uh, just noting that and reflecting on it. Um, it was mentioned earlier in the safeguarding report around the deaths of care home residents, and you can see um, in Thurrock here, 
the proportion of deaths in care home residents is around 17 percent and we've had 86 people who were residents of care home in other care home that have died sadly from Thurrock during the pandemic but you can see in terms of in terms of absolute numbers um, we do compare quite well with our neighbours I haven't got a percentage on this one here um, so I thought that was that was worth noting that this has had a had a, a big toll on our on our population. Um, testing. So as you all know, if, uh, from the 16th of August, uh, the majority of restrictions were lifted, um, and this has really changed the nature of our response since I spoke to you um, at a previous meeting. And one of the ways it's changed is around testing. So we have two types of test sites. In, um, in the borough. We have local test sites, one at Grays Beach and one at Orsett Heath, and then we have the mobile testing units, uh, one at Grover Walk in Corringham and one at Crown Road in Grays. We did have another LTS site in South Ockenden that has now closed, and we're now looking at closing the Crown Road site as well in the next few weeks. As you'll appreciate, Grays Beach and Crown Road are very close together. And although testing has gone up in recent months, now we have wide availability of PCR test kits via the post. It seems sensible to reduce the number of physical sites and the, the amount of disruption that this causes within the borough. Um, lateral flow tests uh, can be collected from pharmacies and 31 of our pharmacies across the borough are signed up to the pharmacy collect scheme, which is excellent. You can also get them for home delivery uh, and certain groups um, have had a, a specific community testing programme, so carers uh, and those known to the drug and alcohol services in particular. We've done a lot of work um, with particularly seldom heard and hard to reach groups such as travellers asylum seekers etc around vaccination for covid uh, and we're now working with the same groups through the same routes around ensuring that they can access testing as well when they need to so testing is very much still part of the armory we have in thurrock uh, to respond to covid but the way it looks it is changing so i just mentioned vaccinations this is our vaccination data currently um, you will see now from the numbers that in our sort of over over 65s, over 90% have now had two doses. And actually, if you compare the first dose and second dose percentages, the vast majority of people who've had one dose have now had two doses. Um, the rates are increasing in our um, in our 30s to 39s. But where we have a slight concern, or I have a slight concern, is the vaccination take up in our 18 to 29 year olds. So, so you'll recall I just said that that's, those have been the age groups where we've seen the highest number of cases. And our uptake of the vaccine seems to have stalled somewhat. It hasn't really moved. Um, in the past few weeks, we're sort of stuck at around 57%. Um, our comms team are doing a lot of work um, targeting social media messages uh, that are aimed at young people. We've recorded, we did a lot of research within Thurrock among our residents on why people might not be having the vaccination, what their concerns were. And we know that in this age group, particularly safety concerns is a pan age concern, but um, concerns about fertility, at pregnancy, that kind of thing, are particularly relevant for this age group. So we've done some very short videos aimed at um, that age group to try and allay some of the, the concerns around the vaccination. So we're doing a lot of work with our CCG partners as well, but that is an area I think that we've got a bit stuck on. What is encouraging though, you can see that almost a third of our 16 and 17 year olds have now had a first dose, which is really excellent. And they've all had an invitation to vaccination. So hopefully we will continue to see that percentage going up. Um, this is the geographical spread. Um, I think um, all our postcodes have had at least one case within the past two weeks. Um, you may remember back in the early summer, we had lots of white on here, which meant there were no cases in some postcode areas. So it is quite geographically widespread across the borough. Uh, what we have got, though, is no care homes with a live outbreak. One is in recovery from an outbreak and two have an exposure, which means they've essentially got one case. Um, and these are often staff cases. So that is a very positive picture. Uh, we've got no schools in live outbreak, but let's see what happens over the next uh, few weeks when the schools go back. So in conclusion, our positive 
uh, test rates have plateaued over recent weeks. The number of PCR tests has increased slightly uh, and our positivity rates that continues to be uh, somewhat plateaued as well. The majority of testing is the LFD testing with over 9,000 tests recorded last week. Um, and our geographic distribution of cases show, it shows that all LSOAs have seen at least one positive test in the past 14 days. Hospital bed use has increased steadily over the last fortnight, sadly, um, and there were five COVID positive admissions for Thurrock residents to BTUH in the most recent week of data we've got. Uh, we still continue to focus on vaccinations and it's now being rolled out to the 16 to 17 year olds. Uh, and as I said, post August 16th, our local response is stepping down. I mentioned the changes to, to testing, obviously with the removal of the requirement to self-isolate for many groups if you are uh, a contact. Um, this changes our need for contact tracing and we're stepping down the contract contact tracing capacity at the end of this month and also our COVID marshals will be stopping at the end of this month. We have however kept them throughout September just to help with that return to school in case there are any issues there so so they will still be about um, for the next few weeks. So our key priorities remain maximising vaccine uptake um, and supporting the return to school. You will be aware that Scotland, whose schools go back earlier than in England, has seen um, a spike associated with return to school. So, so directors of public health are, are watching this quite closely. The, the key messages in terms of what we can do as a community to keep ourselves and our friends and family safe remain the same. Uh, social distancing remains um, the key the key thing for individuals where you can. Also, uh, obviously, um, ventilation, although that gets a bit more difficult as we get into the winter, um, hand hygiene um, and face coverings. So, so it's the same messages. And our comms, although those messages are sort of um, less acute now, are still remaining, uh, still continuing to push those messages out to remind people of the uh, actions we can take. Thank you, Chair. That's it. Brilliant, Joe. Thank you, and well timed. Um, I, one of the questions I, I can answer myself to be truthful. Um, obviously, Farrak uh, has fallen not slightly behind um, the rest of the, the the area within the the take up of the double vaccine, so the two doses. So, if I look at some of the states' uh, stats off the government dashboard today, so the second dose total is 66.6%. Where you have Basildon at 78%, Havering at 72%. Do you, what sort of difficulties do we face uniquely in this area that is making this uptake of the second vaccine more difficult? You know, that's a really good question, and I'm not sure we're entirely clear on that. Um, the we are behind some of our neighbouring boroughs, as you say, and we've done some extensive research on the reasons why people in Thurrock uh, are concerned about having the vaccine. But actually, that the reasons that we have come up with, they're locally nuanced, but they're no different from uh, the findings of national research in this regard. So quite why we have a higher level of um, vaccine hesitancy I am not sure, actually. Um, as I say, the reasons that we identified from our research, um, there were a lot of concerns, at least initially, about the rapidity uh, with which the vaccines were developed uh, and the safety concerns. I think a lot of those fears are gradually being allayed now. There was some unhelpful um, social media posts quite early on around um, impacts on fertility, on pregnancy that were incorrect and have been removed. But those those sort of negative stories have persisted. So we're trying quite hard to counter some of these negative perceptions about both female and male fertility. Um, so we know what some of the reasons are qualitatively, but in terms of the numbers, to be honest, that's quite hard to say. OK, thank you, Joe. Uh, does any members have any other questions? Okay, then quickly, I'm going to have to suspend orders. I would like to move to motion without notice to suspend council procedure rule 11.1 .1 to allow the meeting to continue beyond the two and a half hour time limit. This should only go on for about another 10 minutes. Uh, Councillor Fish. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, because uh, you mentioned about the schools going back and possible rising cases, what mitigations are being put in place in Thurrock in, in classrooms to try and 
reduce the uh, number of cases? So this week, myself and Sheila Murphy, uh, the Corporate Director for Children's Services, have written to all schools, um, just advising them um, of what the guidance is currently for going back to school. Um, the key thing that is happening over the next week is, as um, in previous, the start of previous terms, all secondary school children will be doing two LFD tests on site in school. That's really important. Um, so that we can start the school term as confident as we can be that we've got uh, no COVID cases going into into school. Of course, no, uh, the LFD tests aren't perfect, um, but it's it's the best um, we've got in our armoury. Um, children, secondary school children and young people uh, and staff are also being asked for the rest of the term to continue to do LFD tests twice a week. If someone's test is positive, they're then advised to do a PCR test and they need to isolate um, until they either get a negative test or until the isolation period is up. So, so that that is in place. I mean, the guidance for schools now remains the same. It's just there's no mandating, say, of wearing masks in classrooms or communal areas. However, um, the guidance states that this this is a, a, an action that, that can be taken by individuals. The guidance for schools is to maximise ventilation um, in, in classrooms in particular, but of course that gets more difficult as we get into winter. Um, there's also not, it's now not mandatory to wear masks on uh, transport, public transport, but again, schools may want to advise uh, pupils and families that these measures might be appropriate. So it's quite difficult at the moment because the mandatory measures have gone and it's now down very much to personal judgment. Um, if in the uh, circumstance where there is um, an outbreak within a school, which is now defined as five cases that are that are linked within a school. Public health, uh, the public health team uh, will support the school um, as much as we can, as we have been doing throughout the whole pandemic. But our schools actually have been fantastic throughout the pandemic. They've really got to grips with the outbreak management, with the infection prevention and control, and they really take a lead on um, this themselves now. And I can I have only praise for our heads. Um, of the schools in Thurrock. Um, I, I speak to them regularly at the, at the head teachers uh, meetings and they've really got a grip on this. So I'm confident that our schools will do absolutely the best they can in meeting this challenge. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any other questions? No? Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. And we'll move with that. We'll move on to the work programme. Uh, does any members wish to comment on the work programme? Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of things I think it's worth adding. Um, the Maybe an update, maybe not for this year, but to put on the list for the for next year, an update on the smoking JSNA, because I just, yep. again, just to um, make sure that that's going to come back. I'm sure it will, but it's always good to just have it on there as a reminder. Um, the other one was uh, regarding the integrated medical centres and mm -hmm. AUSIT. Again, I know it's not on there. I'm sure officers will bring it back as and when. But again, just to get that firmed up that it will come back this year. Um, obviously, we got the last update in June. So uh, January, I think, would be a good yeah, time, if not correct. November. I totally agree. I think, I don't know how we, we didn't put that on there, to be truthful, last time. So if we can add that in for January. Um, and also, I know that obviously, Corinum should... Uh, Conum's moving online in January, isn't it? Should be um, March, April. March, April. So January would fall in line pretty well with that, I think. Yeah, and I think just to be mindful of like who we should invite. Obviously, it's I'd love you to have Mark here and discuss, but we haven't had like NHS people here for a while. So like obviously, if we could have everybody in, so it's just not one like pressure on just one person. Um, I did attend a briefing this morning um, of Mid and South Essex Trust who updated us on Orsett Hospital and they said that uh, they were revisiting service and capacity modelling to reflect the realities of a post-pandemic need. I don't know what that means. But um, I, I was also concerned that uh, they said that they that the, the um, phlebotomy and outpatient services would be at three of the sites and that Greys would do the, the majority, which we did know. However, they that was the kind of first confirmation of it, like the everything from Orsett would go um, and I did say that obviously 
also it's a huge site and Long Lane isn't. So how physically is that going to fit? Um, and they agreed that it wouldn't fit, so that they were going to offer a secondary facility, um, but wouldn't say where. So I think that there are a lot of um, questions. I don't know that if that can come, if it should be in November, but happy for that for chair and officers to, to agree that. And then the other question I had was about the fees and charging, charges, price, pricing strategy. Obviously, it's the only item that comes with a financial element. I'm not going to ask for a financial report. I know I'm not going to get one, so I'm going to try. But Ian, just to flag and ask, will it include like an overview of a, a bit of an overview and context of the financial situation within the department? And if it's not in the report, I'll be asking. So just a, just a heads up, just to be fair, that I will ask more of a wider context so that there's a preparation for that because I know financial questions need prep. So thank you, Chair, for allowing that, that extended. Uh, that, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Ian had a far too easy night tonight, so... <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it Makes up from last time, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> OK, brilliant. Um, the other thing that I did notice, so I do believe we agreed to bring back Basin Hospital Maternity for a secondary review. Yeah, there was, an, again, there was an update on the, the call, which is a Mid and South Essex like briefing. Um, and, yeah, they, they did have update, which was very similar to the one that we had previously. So I think if we had one, it wouldn't um, be too dissimilar to the one that we had previously, which was the increase to kind of staffing. And I yeah. didn't see any kind of drastic difference from what we had. But absolutely, if we think it should go in in January or March, again, one to speak to about... Yeah. Yep. Unless there's, I would say that unless there's been a considerable difference, which from the briefing this morning, I don't think that there had. So yeah, a briefing note update, unless there's been a big change again. Okay, to be thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, the other thing I want to cover, um, I appreciate your correspondence today regarding the topic that we want to discuss as a group. Um, I say, we did mention about it being mental health waiting times. Um, I'm still really open to different subjects to open it, so please contact me via email. We need to correspond on the email to work this out, what we want to have achieved. As Councillor Holloway rightly pointed out, we need to have this in line with the officers so we, we know that we're going to get some sort of result from this and we can follow through. Okay. Um, Chair. Yeah. Uh, just ask, um, for January, it's got a mental health and primary care report is is it a primary care mental health report or is it separate primary care and a separate mental health report just some clarification on the kind of scope of the ask mm. for the January report can you remember when it was added I don't Jenny might be able to <laughs> And again, guidance, you know, very much take guidance from you guys what's appropriate to, to come to us. So uh, what you deem appropriate and most useful for us to to receive, obviously bearing in mind what we asked for back when, and thank goodness Jenny's keeping track. Thank God for Jenny. <laughs> and on that note, um, that concludes the business of the meeting this evening. I now declare the meeting closed at 9.37pm. Thank you. <laughs>